Only 15% that watch my videos are subscribed. Please don't forget to if you like my content. This helps me out a lot. Enjoy the video. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was in my apartment sound asleep. I woke up and rolled over towards my fiance Beth. I was 24 years old and Beth was 23. We had been together for four years and had been planning on getting married later that year. Hey. We were actually in the planning stages of the wedding and were scheduled to meet with one of our prospective caterers for a food tasting that evening after work. As usual, during the night our bodies had become entwined. As I moved, Beth's left eye popped open. Don't even think about it, she said sleepily. You're not getting any. Only because I don't want any, I said right back. Even if you did want it, she said. That was enough of a challenge to me. I kicked one leg over hers and started blowing on her belly. Her legs started to twitch. I moved my hands up to her huge breasts and blew on the underside of both. Stop it, she said sharply, but her legs began to move apart. I gently grabbed onto one of her tits and sucked the nipple into my mouth. Her moan escaped her clenched teeth and both of her eyes were suddenly open. While one of my hands played with her tit, the other started inching. It's way south. It continued traveling until it reached the warm, furry triangle between her massive thighs. Beth isn't a tiny girl. She's an Amazonian type woman. She's 5 foot 10 and weighs over 200 pounds. A lot of that is boobs. She has a huge rack, nice legs, and a nice butt too. Beth's head of streaked blonde curls lifted as she looked me in the eye. I love you, Gallon, she said, and then our mouths locked. She spread her legs and pulled me up between them. Our hips locked together, almost as if they were magnetic. We began a dance as old as humanity. The horizontal bump, the hookah chuka, the beast with two backs, whatever you call it. We were doing it. It seemed as if Beth and I were constantly having sex. That morning was nothing unusual. We did it at least twice a day. There were also days when we got so horny for each other that we came home at lunch for quickies. That morning turned out to be a three-hole morning. After I came in her pussy, she sucked me back to hardness and rolled over, shaking her big butt at me. She reached back and pulled her cheeks apart in an invitation that I'd had to have been dead to resist. After the first few strokes in her forbidden passage, she scooted forward and got onto her side. She lifted one of those big legs skyward and pulled me over to her. I reinserted myself in her back door as she wrapped her arms around me. We started kissing and sucking each other's tongues as if there was no tomorrow. We were both streaming sweat in the early August heat as I slowly and gently probed her rectum. My hands weren't idle. One squeezed one of her pillow-sized boobs and the other danced daintily across her swollen clit. Her hands arched around behind her pulling me against her, furiously. Galen, I'm gonna come again, she warned. Hold it back, Beth, I begged. Mmm, it's too good she whimpered. I... I can't wait. Oh, oh, ah, uh, I'm done. She pushed me away. I looked at her angrily. Beth, get your ass back in this bed, I said. Jesus, Galen, are you trying to fuck me to death? She asked. You already came twice this morning and we do have to go to work. I pouted. Always leave them wanting more, she smirked. This way you'll go the whole day thinking about nothing besides getting your dick back up in my fat ass tonight. She blew me a kiss and headed for the shower. A few seconds after the water started, I opened the shower door and pushed her against the wall. I'm not the biggest guy in the world, and if Beth had tried to, she could have resisted my efforts. I spread those big legs apart and reached around grabbing a handful of those big soap-covered tits. I started blowing in her ear and her knees got weak. You're going to make us late, she whined. I started stroking her sides. I felt and squeezed her big butt cheeks. Then suddenly I slapped her ass as hard as I could. She shrieked in shock. The fact that her body, including that ass, was wet added to the sting. I took one of her arms and raised it over her head as the water fell on us. From behind my back, I pulled out a pair of handcuffs and cuffed both of her arms to the pipe that the water came out of. Galen, she whined. Don't. I slapped her ass several more times, each stroke a slightly harder. I noticed that her nipples were as hard as diamonds. 
I pinched them hard and then reached over and bit one of them until she started squirming. Oh, fuck! she screamed. I turned her back around so I was behind her. I reached around her and squeezed those big tits as hard as I could. Then I grabbed her big belly and jiggled it. Galen, leave my fat stomach alone, she said. It's ugly. It's sexy, I said. Someday in the near future, I'm going to put a baby in it. She hissed as a shiver passed through her. I jammed my rampant dick into her in one shot and started fucking her as hard as I could, where we'd been gentle and loving in the bed. This time we were brutal. Each thrust almost lifted her off of her feet. The squishy sounds as I rammed her wet pussy were louder than the sound of the water falling on us. Her squeals were evidence of the fact that she loved what she was getting. After every few strokes, I slapped her ass brutally, causing her to squeal all over again. Fuck me, Galen, she hissed. Oh shit, do it. Come in me. I want it. You can do whatever you want. My dick started trying to spurt out sperm, but there was nothing left. I still felt the tingles, but my balls were already empty. Oh God, that was good, she said. I hugged her. She leaned over and kissed me. Our tongues dueled inside of our mouths. Can I finish my shower now? She asked. We're already going to be late. I had a sudden urge. I pointed my dick at her and just let a stream of warm yellow piss flow all over her. She was shocked. It rolled down her sides and over her large ass. Honey, I always told you that you could do whatever you wanted to me, she said. It's good to see that you're thinking about things for us to do, but we really need to get to work. Okay, scratch that. I need to get to work. You're a hotshot salesman with an expense account and all of that crap. But some of us are only lab techs who have to punch in and out. I quickly unhooked her handcuffs. She pulled me over to her and started soaping us both up. I returned the favor and spent a lot of time soaping her tits. Galan, stop it, she said sharply. I don't have any sick days left. I only have few vacation days left. We can't stay home and fuck every time you get a notion. Okay. I said sadly. Galon, what is it with us? She said. I can't seem to get enough of you, even after all of this time. I shook my head. I don't know, I said. I just love you so much. But I'm fat, she said. Beth, you are the sweetest, nicest woman I know, I said. Your smile lights up any room you walk into. I love having you in my life. Well, you're the only one, she said. But since you're the only one I want, it's not important. We started rinsing off the soap and she hesitated. Galen, did you mean what you said? She asked. About putting a baby in me, I meant. I nodded. She dropped to her knees and reached for my dick. Beth, I have nothing left, I said. I know that dummy, but like I said... I want you thinking about fucking me all day long, she said. She knelt there trying to resuscitate me, but I couldn't rise to the occasion. A shiver went through my spine as though that moment, with Beth's head cradled in my lap while water rained down on us, was an omen of some sort. And that's how the story begins. Everything before that moment was a preamble. I had a sudden vision of Beth and I doing that same thing only instead of it being a very happy time, it would be something else. I really didn't want to let her go. I was sure that if I did, our lives would change. Beth thought that I was just being playful and pulled herself out of my grasp. Beth hurriedly dressed and got ready for work. I took my time. As a sales account manager, I could get to work whenever I felt like it. She glared angrily at me as she hurried out of our apartment. Galen, I can barely walk, she snapped. The smile on her face spoke differently though. Beth. I punched in with only moments to spare. I had thoughts of Galen running through my head as always. As I got to my station, I had to clear my mind so I could concentrate on my job. It was hard. This was the best time of my life. I was young and I was in love. I also had a good job in my chosen field and a wedding to plan. It sounds like a normal life. It sounds like a good life. It sounds like what every young girl wants. But it doesn't seem normal for me. Let's face it, bigger girls very seldom get the brass ring. Prince Charming doesn't usually factor in when the princess weighs over 200 pounds. When I was growing up, I never had a boyfriend. I bore the marks of the double whammy. 
First off, I've always been heavy. Secondly, I'm a science nerd. Put those two traits together, and it spells L-O-N-E-L-Y. Some of the prettier girls had boyfriends when we were in middle school. Most of the girls had boyfriends in high school. Not me. I was still single all through college. I have a pretty face and really big tits. I got a lot of guys, especially during college who were interested in me out of sheer curiosity. But I never had anyone who wanted a relationship. When I turned 20, I made a deal with one of the nerd boys in one of my classes. Ernie Ziegfelder was even more nerdy than I was, but he was also a tit man. Ernie stared at my chest more than he did the board in class. I finally cornered him and told him that he could play with my tits and suck them as much as he wanted if he took my virginity. It was quick, it was painful, and it was embarrassing. It's something I look back on and laugh now. I was so disappointed that I almost got angry. For 20 years I had been hearing about how great sex was, and when I finally experienced it, I found out that it wasn't anything special. I still didn't see what all of the hype was about, but at least I'd done it. I graduated with a BA in chemistry and decided to work for a while before going for my masters. I started working here at Allied Chemical that same year. There, I was a full-fledged adult woman, and nothing had changed. In elementary school, I got picked on and laughed at because I was the fat girl. In middle school, I got picked on and laughed at because I was the fat girl. High school, same thing. College, of course, was different. It was full of adults who were beyond that type of behavior. There, I got picked on and laughed at because I was the fat woman. Out here in the real world, surprisingly things are the same. The difference is that they hide it. Women stand around the coffee machine and have little conversations that I'm not invited to. I've overheard them talking about me, and the jokes are the same as they've always been. The men are worse than the women, or they used to be. All of that changed though when I met Galen. Galen is very handsome. After meeting him, I changed my mind about love at first sight being bullshit. He walked into the lab with Robert, our plant manager, and our eyes met across the room. Robert brought him over to talk to me about getting some samples of one of the drugs we were about to market. He was very shy and very nice. Some of the secretaries and office workers laughed at me when they noticed me staring at him as he walked away. No chance, fatty, they laughed. I'll come back and tell you all about him, laughed Dana Brooks, who was one of the biggest flirts in the company. And sure enough, she threw herself at him when he stopped by the next day to pick up the samples. He spoke to her for a while. I was angry the whole time, but so was also used to losing out to the slimmer girls. But surprisingly, he spent time talking to me after I handed him the samples. He asked me about some of the things on my desk. That led to us talking about a Star Wars, and before I knew it, it was time to go home and the women in the office were livid. Over the next few weeks, those long conversations became a regular thing. They morphed into lunches together, which eventually became trips to the movies, which became dates. It took a while because we were both nervous, but the dates led to kissing, and the kisses were so good that I started to get scared. I began to wonder about my body. Galen and I had a really good thing going. We had so many things in common. I loved kissing him and the feelings I got when he gently rubbed my breasts through my clothes often left me warm and wet, but having him see all of me had me worried. But it was something that both of us wanted so badly that it hurt. When it finally happened, my life changed. Galen had taken me to a Star Wars marathon. We started out holding hands and exchanging occasional kisses. The kisses grew more frequent, and his hands dropped to my tits. I was so hot that I put his hands under my blouse in the concealing darkness of the theater. One of his hands slid down south and started softly rubbing my vagina, and right there in the theater, I moaned. I could barely stay still in my seat. All of a sudden, sex made sense. Before I knew it, Galen's fingers were inside of my panties and I was urging him on. I was so wet that it felt as if I was dripping. Galen brought his hand up out of my panties and held his fingers under my nose. I got a whiff of my own heady arousal fragrance. Better than any flowers, he whispered. I was so close to coming from just what he'd been doing with his fingers that I didn't want him to stop. Are you going to put your hand back? I whispered. His other hand was still busy under my blouse, and my breasts felt like they were growing under his attention. 
In a minute, he said. As I watched, he took the fingers that he had just pulled out of my pussy and started sucking them. God, you taste good, he hissed. That was it. I came harder than I ever had with any vibrator. None of the fumbling nerds that I had been with had ever pushed me over the top. But Gallen had done it without even touching me. Just the sight of him licking my pussy juice off of his fingers made me explode. I had to put my hand over my mouth to avoid having my scream heard by everyone around us. As soon as I regained my composure, I grabbed his hand and dragged him out of the theater. Displaying his typical naivete, Gallen asked, Did I do something wrong? Are you angry at me? Hell yes, I snapped. Why the hell would you do something like that to me in the middle of the Phantom Menace? So the date is over? I don't get another chance? He asked seriously. Gallen, you can have all the chances you want, I said. But for now, take me to your apartment. Once we got behind closed doors, our clothing was quickly discarded. Gallen was like a kid let loose on a playground alone. He did, and tried everything. He had my pussy in every position he could think of. For the next few weeks, that was all we did. We met up after work and fucked. Gallen went after me like a scientist. He experimented, documented, and collected the results. By the end of a month, Gallen had fucked every hole in my body. He had crammed his dick into every crevice, crack, and depression I had. He also had me doing research. It took me only a month to learn to deep throat him. A lot of women consider themselves talented if they can swallow their man's cum. Swallowing is old hat. Swallowing means he comes in your mouth and you pass it down your throat. We're much more efficient than that. Galen sticks his dick down my throat. We bypass the mouth completely. He shoots his sperm directly into my esophagus. My throat muscles, the same ones used for passing food into my stomach, massage his dick and pump the sperm out of it. I also learn to love it when he fucks my ass. It really comes in handy during my period. Maybe it's a psychological thing, or an inferiority complex, but we have sex every day. We have not missed a day since we started. I get really grumpy if I don't get fucked. It could be the fact that I started so late in life, so my body is making up for lost time. It could I also be the fact that I love Gallen so desperately, I love touching him and being touched by him. There is nothing I wouldn't do for my man. After we'd done as much as we could think of when it came to positions and parts, we continued to experiment. We've done bondage and a few other things. The problem with that was that although I don't mind being tied up occasionally, Galen isn't much of a dominating personality. He was also simply incapable of hitting me even in a role-playing situation. We both love golden showers and body fluids. There have been times when I thought Galen was trying to lick my pussy dry, but neither of us was into defecation or spitting. Neither of us went in for exhibitionism either. In my case, it was because I simply can't imagine anyone except Galen wanting this fat body. In his, it was because he's really shy. We almost tried swapping once. We met with the other couple and had a nice dinner. We took them back to our place and turned the lights down low. I was feeling really nervous about it. And as if to prove that we were meant for each other, Galan just said no and turned the lights back on. I can't do it, he told us. Beth is mine. I don't think I could handle the thought of her with someone else. By that time, the other woman had already taken her clothes off. She was thin and I had been sure that Galen would have liked her. My blouse was the only thing I had taken off. The guy from the other couple seemed unable to take his eyes off of my tits. He was really pissed. After they left Galan and I talked about it. So I'm yours, huh? I asked, smiling. He just nodded. Galen, that woman was really cute, I said. And I would still have been every bit yours when you got done with her. She has no ass and no tits, he spat. I need something nice and soft to feel on. Sorry if I messed things up for you, but I would have felt like I got cheated. Galen, you sound silly, I said. I had no interest in that guy. I was only going to do it for you. I'd do anything for you, especially since I know that I'm yours now. Take your clothes off, he said. I pulled my pants down and took off my bra. He walked over to me and slapped my ass. It stung like hell. Who told you to keep your panties on, he asked. I quickly pulled them off and let them drop on the floor. Get over here and suck my dick, he told me. He didn't have to tell me twice. 
It took me about 10 minutes to reduce him to a boneless blob on the sofa. After that, he had me stand up and he walked around me in a circle. From now on, this is the way you dress when we're alone, he said. I just nodded. It was hard for me to keep a smile off of my face. When Galen had announced to the other couple that I was his, had been the happiest moment of my life. For the first time in my life, I was someone's girlfriend. Oh yeah, he corrected. I do want you to wear one thing. I think I was expecting a chastity belt or a slave collar. I would have happily accepted either one. But I was floored when he reached into his pocket and pulled out a small square box. I had no idea what was in it. Then he dropped to one knee and held up a ring. I went into shock. Galen is that... Um, what is it? I asked. I had an idea, but I was afraid of making a mistake and ruining the best night of my life. I thought that maybe it was a friendship ring or one of those promise rings. What does this look like Beth? He asked. It's an engagement ring. I love you. I want us to get married. And I just stood there staring at it. It was all I could do to stay on my feet. So are you going to answer me? He asked. Galen, you idiot, I said. I already told you I was yours. This just lets everyone else know it. We're going to be together until the end of time. I love you too. I couldn't help it. I just started crying after that. It was the happiest moment of my life. Galen was my life. We were always happy. The only dark spot in my existence was the time I had to spend at work. I was still enduring and trying to ignore all of the laughing and jeering and fat jokes. In fact, the women treated me even worse after they saw my ring. I realized that a big factor in the way they treated me was jealousy. Of course my confidence went through the roof then. I had Galen so I really didn't care what the other guys thought. And the knowledge that those stupid women were jealous of me only added to my confidence. I started to dress better at work and people noticed it. I didn't realize the effect it had on people until one day I called the supply manager to put in a wreck for some chemicals. Under our old system, you could just call Todd and tell him who you were and what you needed. Under the new system, you had to fill out a written requisition. Beth, you have to fill out the correct form, he said. Todd was one of the men who was always laughing at me and calling me fat. I knew that he was going to use this opportunity to harass me. Beth, you could come over to my office and I'll give you the form and show you how to fill it out, he said. I needed the supplies to do my job, so I went. He closed the door behind me, and I expected him to say a bunch of mean things to me. I wasn't ready for what happened. Beth, I... I want to apologize for all of the bad jokes and terrible things I've said to and about you, he said. Here, have a seat at my desk and I'll get the form. He came back a few minutes later, and while I was very relaxed, he seemed nervous. He seemed so nervous that it was as if he was about to pop. I took a pen from his desk and began filling in the information on the form while he watched me. I looked up suddenly to ask him a question and everything became clear to me. The blouse I had worn that day showed a lot of cleavage and my lab coat was unbuttoned. Todd was staring at my boobs like a junkie, staring at a bowl of heroin. Sorry, he stammered. I've never seen boobs that big this close. Okay, let's hear it, I said. Let's hear what, he asked. I said I was sorry for staring, I couldn't help it. You know, the fat joke, the insult, I said. No jokes, no insults, he said. I'm done with that. Well, that's good, I said. That stuff always makes me feel really bad. It's hurtful. Maybe we could make a deal he said. The look on his face should have told me to just leave, but I was curious. How about if you and I became friends, he suggested. Not only would I not insult you, I'd make sure no one else does either. And what exactly would I have to do for this friendship, I asked. Nothing really, he said quietly. He waited for a while and then came out with it. Could I see them? Just once? Are you out of your mind? I said. I'm engaged. Galen would be pissed. Besides, these aren't even my boobs. They're his. 
I just carry them around for him. He's never going to hear about it, he whined. I just want to look. He walked over to a cabinet and opened the drawer. He pulled out several magazines and showed them to me. They were all magazines with titles like Jugs, Boosin, and Big Tops. I have all of these magazines, he said. I dream of women like you. But I married my high school sweetheart and her chest is as flat as a board. I love her. We have four kids but I still dream about, please. Okay, I said, but stay over there. I slowly unbuttoned the five buttons on my shirt that were done up. Lock the door, Todd. He turned and locked the door. I let the blouse drop down into the chair. Then I pulled my bra straps down and pulled the bra down around my waist. I thought Todd's eyes were going to bug out of his head. Seeing his reaction gave me a tingle. I don't think it was sexual as much as it was a feeling of power over this man who had once intimidated me. I lifted my breasts and played with my nipples, and Todd suddenly proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was a tit man. She eat, he said, and suddenly the room smelled like sperm. It was a good thing that Todd was wearing dark pants. I fixed my bra and closed my blouse as Todd ran into his bathroom to fix himself. Over the next few weeks, Todd kept his promise. No one at work made fun of me anymore when he was around. He even made those jealous women stop bothering me. Every once in a while, I'd go into Todd's office and give him a refresher. After that, going to work was no longer a problem. My life was perfect. Gallon. I left the apartment a few minutes late, but I didn't worry about it. Today was going to be a good day. I would go into work and my boss was going to surprise me with yet another Top Salesman of the Month award. Of the 15 sales account managers in our division, no one came close to me in sales. Of the seven months of the year that we'd gone through, I'd won the award five times and four times consecutively. I got into my pewter 2014 Mustang 5.0 and thought about what I would say when I got the award. I hoped that we'd have a big assembly like we'd done the previous month. That way Beth could be there when I got it. I walked into the building like I owned it. In a way, I did. The salesmen were the top dogs in the company. They could make all of the drugs they wanted, but without someone to sell them, no money would come in. As I got in the elevator, I remembered that I needed samples of our new NSAD drug. I had several major customers who were eager to try the drug out. I sold to major retailers, several drug store chains, and more than 50 clinics and small medical offices. I also handled four out of the six hospitals in our region. I decided to just get some samples from Todd. As soon as I walked into the office section, Glory waved at me. Glory was Gloria Bunker, our office manager. Glory was a friend. She was very different from most of the secretaries, assistants, and stanos that worked in the office. She was also a bit older. Glory was 55 and divorced. Before I had gotten together with Beth, she was always telling me that I needed to meet her daughter. Number one again? She smirked. What am I going to do with you? I just smiled and waved back. I walked across the large office floor to Todd's office. I yanked the door open without even thinking about it and looked across the desk expecting to see Todd. I did see Todd, but he wasn't alone and he wasn't doing what I expected. Todd wasn't hunched over his desk going over Rex. He was hunched over, though. Unfortunately, he was hunched over licking a massive breast. He was moaning almost as loud as the man behind her humping away at her pussy. That man was very familiar to me. It was Brent Stevens, my nearest rival in terms of sales. As Brent fucked her, the woman sucked away lazily at Craig Crawford's dick. Hey, close that goddamn door, hissed Craig until he realized who I was. Suddenly, the four of them froze in place. Four jaws simultaneously dropped. Four pairs of eyes grew as big as saucers at the same time. Awkward, smirked Craig. You can go next, said Brent. Oh, shit, yelled Todd. Oh, no, wailed Beth. Oh, please, no. Fuck you, I spat angrily. Fuck you all. Hey, Galen, wait a minute, said Brent. Can we talk about this? I just walked out of the office, leaving the door open as the four of them struggled to get their clothes on. I staggered away from the office and was barely noticed by most of the people in the office. I got the idea that that Glory noticed me. She had an idea that something had just happened to me, but she had no idea what it was. Even though nothing was wrong with me physically, 
I was in more pain than I had ever endured in my life. I was on the verge of vomiting everything in my stomach. I just needed to keep moving, or I was sure I would spew all over the office. I headed for the door as quickly as I could. Several people tried to stop me to congratulate me on the award, but I just brushed past them. Brent and Todd had quickly pulled their pants up and were following me. I guess Craig was trying to tend to Beth. I got to the parking lot before Brent and Todd caught me. Once I got into my Mustang, the race was over. I saw Brent get eye to his car and he was closer to the front exit of the parking lot than I was. He moved his car into position to block me even as Todd tried to run over to my car. I drove around the building and left through the rear exit. I drove over two blocks and cut back and drove right past Brent. I blew my horn as I passed the lot. Brent tried to chase me, but his Buick was nowhere near a match for my car. I quickly lost him on the freeway. I made it to our apartment and quickly packed as much as I could carry. Considering the size of the Mustang's trunk, it wasn't much. I'd have to make several trips. I was sure that I'd be able to come back for more over the next few days while Beth was at work. Even thinking about her hurt, I was barely able to conceive of the fact that my life with Beth was over. Less than four hours prior, we'd been fucking like there was no tomorrow. Apparently, we'd gotten that part right, because for us, there was no tomorrow. It was about that time that my phone rang. I looked at the screen. Surprisingly, it wasn't Beth. I answered it as I continued to pack. Yeah, Glory, what's up? I asked. Are you okay? She asked. Just peachy, I said as I started disconnecting the cables from my computer. Why did you leave so abruptly? She asked. Maybe you should get your ass back here. There's a lot of shit going on. I probably won't be back today, I said. I'm also probably not coming in tomorrow either. I have some stuff to take care of. Are you embarrassed about the award again? She asked. You know, I thought we'd gotten over that. The old man is wondering when you'll be in so we can do it. He really gets into that whole thing. I guess I should probably tell you that your fiancé is having some sort of breakdown. She's been alternating between vomiting and crying since a little bit after you left. You wouldn't happen to know what's behind that, would you? Glory, leave it alone, I said. Beth is no longer my fiancé, so whatever she's going through is no skin off of my ass. Galen, you dumped her, didn't you? She asked. That was a terrible thing to do at work. I never thought you had it in you to be so cruel. I never thought that she was your type, but I always figured that you would be a lot classier when things ended. Glory, it wasn't me who ended things, I said. I was barely able to keep my voice from breaking. Holy shit. You sound like you're crying, Galan. What did she do? She asked. Glory, I have a lot to do, I said. I have to get as much of my stuff as I can carry and find another apartment. Galen, if you need someone to talk to, I'm always available, she said. I continued to pack, but my mind was far away from the task. I wondered again what the hell had happened to us. We had been happy. I was sure of it. I was also sure that we loved each other. There were so many questions that I wanted the answers to. I wanted... I needed to know why, of course. But I also needed to know how long it had been going on. I guess the why was most important. But the how long was just out of curiosity, because I had no idea that it had been going on. None of the signs of disrespect or any lack of affection had been present. If I had to put my finger on exactly when she started, I don't think I could do it. At the same time, I felt as if my heart was about to burst. I had loved Beth. I still loved Beth so much that it was painful. How could I still love her after what she'd done? I had no clue, but I did. Perhaps it was as they say, you can't just turn off love. Maybe Maria Carey had said it best before she went crazy, love takes time. In the meantime, I was acting on instinct. My conscious mind had been overruled by an animal's basic need to go to ground and hide when wounded. The problem was that I had no idea where to go. I got into my Mustang and started driving. Then I remembered the motels clear across town near the airport. I drove there and checked in. I unpacked my things because I would probably be there for a while. I lay down on the bed to take a nap, but before I could close my eyes, my phone rang. Apparently, Beth had gotten her head out of her ass and called me. I had been expecting it. I hadn't expected it to take nearly as much time as it did, though. 
She probably had to take some time to figure out a convenient lie to tell me. She probably also had to fill in her fuck buddies so they could all be on the same page. I let her call go to voicemail. Then while she was leaving her message, I blocked her number. From then on, I wouldn't receive her calls and she would be unable to leave me any messages. After blocking her call, I tried to delete the message she was in the process of leaving, but my phone wouldn't allow me to do it until she finished with it. Whatever lie she was in the process of telling me was probably really long and complicated. I decided to try a really dirty trick just to be free of her. I called her, knowing that her caller ID would show that it was me calling her. She would switch over to talk to me live, ending her voicemail message. She did as I expected. Galen, I'm so... She got out before I hung up on her. Then I deleted her voicemail message without listening to it. I was free of her. I would never have to bother with her again. I tried to settle back on the bed again. It took less than five minutes for my phone to ring again. I looked at the number and didn't recognize it. Hello, I said tentatively. Galen, we need to talk about this, came from the phone. I immediately hung up. I blocked the second number too. It was probably one of her fuck buddies' phone. I turned my phone off and went to sleep. Beth. I was in shock. I couldn't stop crying. It seemed as if I had been crying for hours. Fortunately, no one at the office really knew what had happened. They all assumed that Galen and I had had a fight. I think they also assumed that it had something to do with our wedding plans, or perhaps it was pre-wedding jitters. Brent was supposedly trying to calm me down. He kept announcing loud enough for everyone to hear that he would give Galen a chance to cool down and then go and talk to him. Todd was as upset as I was and so was Craig. Both of them had as much or more to lose as I did. They were both married. The thing that surprised me the most was the depth of human kindness. All of those evil bitches in the office had flocked to me. I grudgingly accepted their comfort and solicitation. I was willing to do anything to feel better, but the only thing that could truly give me peace would be for Galen to come back and talk to me. All of the women there were sure that he would. Men get really funny about getting married, said Sadie Thompson. My husband Steve ran off several times during the last few months before the wedding. But every time he realized what he was running away from and he came back, we've been married for eight years now. Before long, the women in the office began hinting that the three men should probably go somewhere else. We needed some girl talk time, and they were more of a hindrance than a help. I, on the other hand, knew why the men refused to leave. We needed to talk about what had happened and how to handle it. My supervisor, Elaine, came over wondering why I had been out of the lab for so long. A couple of the ladies spoke to her to explain. Glory, who was in charge of the office and was slightly higher in the company pecking order, got her to back off on me. I knew that I wasn't out of the woods yet though because Glory and I were not friends. I knew that she was pretty close with Galen and that was probably the reason she had interceded on my behalf. But the way that she looked at Todd and the others told me that she knew something was going on. I tried calling Galan several times. The first time the phone went to voicemail. I left him a message telling him how what happened was a huge mistake and I was very sorry. I told him that I loved him with all of my heart and that I needed the chance to explain. Before I could tell him all of the things that I wanted to say, the call waiting tone on my phone chimed in. I looked to see who was calling me and it was Galen. I disconnected from the message so I could speak to Galen. It was the first time I had smiled since I left the apartment that morning. As soon as I started talking, he hung up I called back to leave him a message or speak to him and the phone just kept ringing. I knew that Galen had blocked me. My heart lurched. I started crying all over again. All of the women gathered around me. They told me things to comfort me. Several of them apologized for the way they'd always treated me. A couple of them even told me that the reason they treated me so badly was because they were jealous of me. In their words, I was nice. I was pretty. I was smart and I had a wonderful man who loved me like there was no tomorrow. So out of some sort of inferiority complex, they concentrated on my weight to bring me down. We spent an hour at least bonding and getting over our problems. Although I tried to accept their apologies and good wishes, I was pissed. If they hadn't been such a bunch of bitches from the beginning, 
None of this would have happened. Just as the cuddling session ended, Todd came over to me. You need to call him and get this straightened out, Beth, he said. I know that, Todd, I said. No, you don't, he sneered. There's a lot more at stake here than you and Galen's broken hearts. Craig and I are married. We both have kids. And then you also need to remember that the four of us, you, me, Craig, and Brent, all have jobs. Galen is the old man's fair-haired boy. If Galen starts talking about how unhappy he is that his fat-assed girlfriend was fucking some of her co-workers, all four of us could be fired. Shit. The old man might not even have a choice. Galen could threaten to sue the company. Or he might even simply go and tell our wives we would get raped in a divorce. We'd lose custody of our kids. You need to fix this. He blocked my phone, I said. Here, use mine, he said. But fix this quick. Whenever he comes back and they have that awards announcement, he's going to talk to the boss. I have a wife who loves me as much as he loved you. I love him too, you know, I said louder than I'd intended. And what do you mean, loved me? Beth, if you loved him half as much as you seem to think you did, you never would have done what you did with us, he said. And Galen might be a pretty boy, but he ain't no wimp. You know how them bitches have always been picking on you. The men around here were picking on Galen far worse. Galen keeps hitting them where it counts. He keeps outselling them and hitting them in the pocketbook. He has been stealing their accounts and just making them look stupid. You wouldn't believe the way they pick on him. But unlike some people, he never caved. So with that in mind, he ain't the kind of guy who's going to put up with cheating whore as a girlfriend. I started crying. Galen was everything to me. I couldn't lose him. And do yourself a favor, Beth, he said. Be really careful who you trust. Despite what she did for you this morning, Glory, is not your friend. Before you started working in the lab here, she was always trying to hook Galen up with her daughter. With you out of the way, Skandasazmawam. I left the office and went back to the lab. I thought that the familiar surroundings and concentrating on the experimental formula we were working on would take my mind off of things. There was recalling nothing else I could do. The ball was in Galen's court. I already knew what to expect. Galen had two levels of anger. Level one was when he spoke in extremely polite phrases, as if we were strangers. He also made sure not to even brush against me while we were in bed. It hurt badly because I was so used to him wrapping his arms around me and making me feel safe and secure. I had only seen Level 2 once during all of our time together. Level 2 was a full-on silent treatment, and Galen sleeping on the couch. I cried my eyes out and wasn't able to sleep at all, but I had a feeling that I'd be getting a Level 2 tonight. I dropped several vials of chemicals over the next two hours. I also messed up the mix rate for a couple of experiments. My mind simply wasn't on my work. I told my supervisor and she agreed that I should just go home. I had no idea where Galen had gone. I was sure that he'd gone out to see a few of his customers. Galen was great with his customers, and driving his car from one appointment to another gave him a chance to think and clear his mind. Sooner or later, Galen would decide that he needed to hear my side of the story. All I could do is wait until he did. I drove home and took the elevator to our floor. During the drive home, I'd come up with all sorts of ideas. I could make Galen's favorite dinner. I could also put on once of those movies that he was always trying to get me to watch. Galan and I were both sci-fi nuts, but we had different tastes. We both loved Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, but after that we sharply separated in our tastes. Where I loved vampires and horror, Galen was more into Highlander and sword and sorcery tales. If one of those Highlander movies was on our flat screen when he came in, Galen would have to watch it. I would start making faces and he would try to explain what was going on and why it wasn't stupid. I had a smile on my face as I put my key in the lock. Galen and I had rarely ever been able to finish a movie in one sitting. If you put the two of us on a couch together, we would invariably end up having sex. As soon as I stepped into the apartment, I knew that something was wrong. It took me a few moments to realize what it was. All of Galen's personal stuff and a lot of his clothing was missing. I went into the room we used as an office. My desktop computer was there, but Galen's was gone. His laptop, his iPad, and his PlayStation 4 were gone too. 
Most of his suits were gone. Galen had at least seven or eight different suits. As a salesman, he had to dress well when calling on customers. His running clothes and running shoes were gone too. Galen had been very thorough. He had taken everything he'd need to be away from home for a good period of time. I just plopped down on the sofa and cried. Somehow, I don't know when, I fell asleep. When I awoke, it was even worse. I felt empty. It was as if a part of me was missing. I took a couple of days off from work to get my head on straight. I thought about it over and over again and realized that I had made a mistake. I'm a human being and a young one at that. I have never claimed to be a perfect woman. I was very wrong. I was willing to admit that. But Galen needed to understand that what happened never happened because I didn't love him. It never happened because I wanted to join those men in disrespecting him. It was simply a way for me to get away from the torment I faced every day at work. I'm sure that Galan would probably have told me to talk to someone at work about being harassed, or he would have told me to just suck it up and beat them at their own game the way he does. But I'm not as strong as he is, and as far as going and complaining to someone about being harassed, I'm a grown woman. It would seem silly for me to go crying to someone in HR because I was being bullied or because women were being mean to me. I knew that Galen and I could work things out if he would just give me the chance to talk about it. Galen. I woke up the morning after my life fell apart. I immediately started moving. I had plenty of things to do that day, and I was dead set on returning to work the next day. I got my iPad and started looking for apartments to rent. I called on several of them and made arrangements to see them. Of the eight apartments I went to see, only three of them were available for immediate occupancy. Of those three, there was only one that I would consider living in. I was just about to write the landlord a check when one of the tenants came in. I smiled at her and she returned it and then remembered what she had come in for. She'd come in to complain about her car being damaged and broken into in the building's parking structure. I was out of there before he could answer her. I had visions of my Mustang up on blocks with her rims, stereo, nav system, exhaust system, and catalytic converters gone. It was back to the drawing board on terms of finding a place to stay. By that time, the day was halfway over. I knew I had to just go back to the hotel and start looking again. Living out of the hotel would be okay short term, but in the long run, it was far too expensive. My phone rang and I looked at the screen to see who was calling me. Hey, Glory, I said. How are you, she asked. How's Beth? Glory, please don't ask me about that woman, I said sharply. We're done. You're kidding, right, she said. It's not a bit, I told her. It all makes sense now, she said. So that's why she was so hysterical yesterday. She called in today. She's taking the week off. Not my problem or my business anymore, I said. Maybe you should tell Todd, Brent, and Craig. I have to find a new place to live. Why do you need a new place to live? She asked. Glory, you're the smartest person I know, I said. Get with the program. Beth and I were engaged. We live together. We are no longer engaged, so one of us has to move out. I might know of a place, she said. It's not an apartment, though. It's a house. A friend of mine is looking for a housemate to share a house. You'd have full kitchen privileges, your own bathroom, and full run of the house. You'd have to share the cleaning and chores, but more than likely you'd only have to do the guy stuff. You know, like taking out the trash, mowing the yard, light home repairs. That actually sounds like fun, I said. What, what's his name? Um, Gallon, he's a she. But she's old enough to be your mother. So you don't have to worry about her hitting on you, she said. Well, it isn't what I'm looking for, but it sounds good, I said. Do you have the address or a phone number for her? She gave me an address and told me to stop by the place at about seven that evening. I went back to the hotel and looked at a few more listings, just in case the place that Glory suggested didn't work out. My phone rang and I didn't recognize the number, so I answered it. Hey buddy, we need to talk, said a voice that was familiar, yet I couldn't put a name to it. I think we should talk face to face about what happened yesterday and how we should handle it, he continued. That was all I needed for my brain to fire up and make the connection. How did you get my number, Brent? I said flatly. 
When can we talk? He asked, ignoring my question. His behavior was typical Brent, and it was one of the reasons that he would never be more than a mediocre salesman. The only thing that was important to Brent was Brent. He seemed incapable of listening to anyone else, or of trying to see the other person's needs or points. His usual strategy was to try to convince them that what he wanted was the best possible option. I have no intention of talking to you, so if you have something to say, just say it. As soon as we're done here, I'm blocking your number. So talk, I said. Galen, we're co-workers. We have to get along for the good of the company, he said. Anyway, I wanted to offer you a deal. This way we both win. How about if I could get the other guys to all agree that no one needs to know about the little incident from yesterday? We just write it off and forget about it. No harm, no foul. My friends and I don't have to walk around feeling bad about it, and you and Beth just pretend it never happened. You two go ahead and get married and everyone is happy. You never do anything out of the goodness of your heart, I said. What is all of this magnanimity going to cost me? Nothing, he said. I just want you to back off and sell a few less orders over the next month and... Fuck you, Brent, I said. I've already handled things. I broke up with Beth. Anyone who would let a scumbag like you touch her is not someone I want to marry. I had decided to do nothing about what happened except for breaking up with her. But since you've called me, I think I may have to bite the bullet and go to either HR or the old man about it. But Galen, you can't do that, he whined. Come on, buddy, it wasn't my fault. She was just giving that fat pussy away. She sashayed around the place showing off those big old titties all the time. I don't even like fat girls. Nobody could have resisted her. Even his voice sounded like he was smirking. In a way, I did you a favor, he said. I showed you what kind of woman she really is. I hung up on him. I thought about what he'd said, though, and it made me realize that I needed to know why this had happened. I also needed to know how long it had been going on for. I'd been so blinded by love that I'd truly had no idea that Beth had been cheating on me. I puttered around the hotel for a few hours and then heated over to the address that Glory had given me. It was a really nice house. It was a split-level ranch in a comfy suburb. It wasn't a mansion. However, it wasn't too far from it. I rang the doorbell and waited for a few moments. And then I got the second biggest shock in recent memory. Glory answered the door. Hi, I said. Did you come over to mediate things between me and the owner? She smiled back. Galen, I am the owner, she said. She gave me a tour of the place. She showed me where my room was. She also showed me the kitchen, the laundry room, and the rest of the house. I liked it. It had a homey feeling to it. She made coffee and we talked about why she wanted to take in a boarder. It turned out that Glory couldn't stand living alone. She'd lived with her husband and daughter until they divorced. Then she'd lived with her daughter until the daughter graduated from college. Then there had been a few friends of her daughter, until the last of them had graduated a few months ago. Glory had been thinking about putting an ad in the paper until she talked to me. I would actually be her first male boarder, but she and I had such a good relationship that she was sure it would work. Over the next few days, I moved my stuff in after work until I was finally settled in. Work became the problem. It seemed like no matter where I was in the building, either Beth or the assholes she had fucked would show up and want to talk. Finally, on Friday, I agreed to sit down and talk with Beth. Galen, baby, I've missed you so much, she blubbered. You have no idea how much I've... Beth, can we just get to the point, I said. How long were you cheating on me? Why did you do it? I really thought we had something special. We did. We do. She said, Galen, I didn't think of it as cheating on you, and it didn't start that way. Todd has a fetish. He likes big tits and... Most guys do, I said. Well, the women around here and most of the guys too were always picking on me, she said. You know giving me the evil eye and making jokes about my weight. And Todd told me he could make that all stop if I let him look at my tits. So I figured it was only looking. It couldn't hurt anything. But then Brent caught us one day. 
and you know Brent wasn't going to settle for just looking. And I couldn't let you find out, because I was sure you'd dump me, and now you know the whole story. It had been going on for about three months. Beth, thanks for telling me, I said. I guess I'm better off knowing. So now that you know, you can understand that it wasn't my fault, she said. You can see that, right? Beth, why does fault even matter? I asked. In the end, the result is still the same. Okay, maybe you were a victim. Maybe Todd and the others somehow took advantage of you or blackmailed you. Maybe you were just an innocent lamb alone in the woods with predators about. Maybe they preyed on your weakness and your lack of confidence and your negative self-image. Yes, baby, that's exactly what they did, she said excitedly. And it was only sex, right? With them, there was no love involved. It wasn't like what we do, right? I asked. She nodded. So in the end, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect or take anything away from what we had, right? I asked, sounding hopeful. Right as rain, honey, she said. I love you, Galen. Wrong as hell, I said quietly. And I love you too. But it does matter. And it does affect us. It did take something away from us. You shared the most intimate thing that two people can do with a bunch of assholes that don't care about you at all. So how special can it really be if you give it to just anybody? But it's different, she said. I'm sorry, but it really isn't, I said. And then there's the matter of trust. You've already broken my heart once. I can't give you a chance to do it again. I'm sorry, Beth, but this is goodbye. I walked away from her feeling worse than I had ever in life. Beth. The talk didn't go the way I'd hoped it would. There was no way it could have gone worse. I was losing the best part of my life. For the past few years, hell for most of my life, Galen was the best thing ever to happen to me. With Galen out of my life, I was just another sad, depressed, fat girl. For the first week or two, the pain was so bad that I could barely function. I watched the parking lot from my lab constantly, trying to see when Galen was in the building, just so I could get a glimpse of him. For the first two weeks or so, I could see that Galen was off kilter just as much as I was. In fact, it was as if everyone around the company was watching and waiting for something to change. Little by little things went back to a semblance of normalcy, at least it did for most people. However, I would never consider things normal until I got Galen back. One of the things I hated most was watching the woman at work start to take runs at him. It was almost funny. They would flounce themselves over near, where he was standing or sitting, and then begin to accentuate what they thought was their best feature. Carmela fluffed out her long, pretty hair. Galen didn't notice. Elaine stuck out her chest. Galen didn't notice. Marie pretended she had a run in her pantyhose. Galen never noticed. And Sarah stopped in front of his desk and bent over. None of them got anywhere with him. That made me happy. I began to watch Galen at work to see who was successful with him and who he interacted with. It actually gave me hope. Galen didn't really speak to anyone. He spoke only to the old man, which was what we called the owner of the company. And he spoke to Gloria, the office manager. Gloria was in her fifties. She was a pretty woman, but she was old enough to be Galen's mom. That told me a few things. The first thing it told me was that Galen was still getting over me. He hadn't taken up with anyone else because to him, I wasn't easily replaced. I needed to do something to accentuate all the things he loved about me. Perhaps, if I was a better version of me, Galen would give me another chance. I started staying later in the lab. I wanted to modify one of the company's diet pills. Galen loved everything about me. He loved my face and everyone always told me how pretty my face was anyway. He loved my hair. He loved my tits and my ass. If I could target just the fatty areas around my gut, he wouldn't be able to resist me. As I worked on my formula, what I wanted began to change. Most diet pills are amphetamines. They speed up your metabolism and help you burn fat a little bit better than normal. I took that as a base and began to add a few more substances. I added steroids. Steroids do more than make men bigger. They build muscle and strengthen bones. They also make the body more readily able to accept rapid changes in body structure. 
to counteract the masculine effects of the steroids so I could avoid looking like a female bodybuilder, I added several different estrogen compounds. By ramping up my estrogen, I would remain feminine in both attitude and body shape. To supercharge all the other compounds, I added HGH. I had several different versions of the formula ready by the end of September. I took a few weeks to test them all on lab animals. All of my tests looked promising, but out of the five versions of the formula I tested, only two of them caused the mice I was using as test subjects to lose any weight. And it was a strange way to lose weight. I almost didn't notice it at first because it was a very temporary loss. The fluctuation in body mass lasted only minutes. With further modification to the formula, I could prolong the effects, but only up to approximately 30 minutes. I was missing something. I also noticed that the mice had glossier coats and better overall health, but only for the 30-minute period. I continued to experiment, tweaking, and modifying the formula with different hormones and amino acids as a kicker. After being apart for more than six weeks, I began to hear grumbling from many different sources. None of them actually spoke to me, but from overhearing conversations on several different subjects, I heard several of the salesmen, including Brent, whining about the fact that the old man had decided to appoint a sales manager. The new manager would be in charge of all of sales and would be chosen from the ranks of our current sales associates. The men were very sure that Gallen had the job nailed down by virtue of his sales. Galen had always been a great salesman, but since our breakup, he had been on a tear. During September, Galen had nearly doubled his sales and since no one was even close to him, it made some of the other salespeople look as if they were barely working. What do you think will happen when the kid becomes sales manager? Asked Craig. I think you and I will be fired before the ink is dry, spat Todd. I've tried to apologize to him, but the bastard won't even talk to me. I can't believe I'm getting fired over some fat skank. And of course, the women were frustrated too. She acts like she's his mother, said one. I've heard that since he broke up with the Dairy Queen, Gloria has been blocking everyone away from him, said another. I heard that she's trying to put him on ice until her daughter moves back to town, said the first woman again. As soon as they noticed that I was there, they moved the conversation somewhere else. Just hearing that got me angry. All of those catty bitches trying to get my man wasn't bad enough, but hearing that Glory was trying to get him for her daughter made everything worse. I also began to resent Todd, Brent, and Craig. If it hadn't been for them, Galen and I would still be happy and together. With Halloween only a few weeks away and the holiday season just after that, I had even more reasons to be angry. We were supposed to be married a few weeks after Christmas. Just thinking about all the fun things we'd done last Halloween made me even angrier. I'd have no one to go to haunted houses with. There would be no one to feel me up during a hayride. Who would I dress up for? What was the point in even buying a costume if you had no one to show it off for? And the thought of going to a party alone terrified me. It wouldn't even be much fun to stay home and watch scary movies. The second best part of watching the movies was curling up under a blanket while you watched. Of course, the best part was when Gallen rolled me over and fucked me. It happened every time. There are so many movies that I've never seen the endings of, even after multiple viewings. Yep, those three bastards were going to pay for taking Gallen away from me. And it was time. I'd done a bit more experimenting with my formula, and I was ready for a human trial. It wasn't perfect and I still couldn't get the changes to last for more than 30 minutes, but I wanted to see what effect it would have on a human being. My theory was that once you factored in the size of a human being and the metabolic differences, the formula would last an even shorter amount of time on a human. I drove home to my lonely apartment and set up my new iPhone on the table in my bedroom near the only full-length mirror I owned. I said a silent prayer to the gods that I would become so beautiful that Galen had to take me back. Failing that, I prayed that the formula would have no lasting ill effects. Then I started the iPhone's video camera, closed my eyes, and took a healthy swig of the greenish fluid. At first I felt nothing. Then I noticed what felt like itching all over my body. When I looked in the mirror, my clothes appeared to be rustling and moving around my body. I realized after a few seconds that there were changes going on in my body. Some scientist I was, I should have taken my clothes off. 
That was, I could have observed or recorded the changes more clearly. Then I felt a buzzing, like getting stung by several thousand bees all at the same time. My entire body hurt, and I felt as if I was burning up. Even as I looked into the mirror, I was shocked. My face seemed to be getting thinner. Suddenly, I had cheekbones like a fucking model. It actually appeared that my skull had become narrower, and my zygomatic arches stood out further. My lips became puffer. However, that was only the beginning. I was growing taller. Shit. I had to be almost six feet tall. My tits stayed the same size, but my ribcage got smaller and longer. My legs got smaller yet longer at the same time. Duh. I had to get taller in order to be thinner. The formula kept me at the exact same mass and weight. It simply redistributed the mass. I probably weighed exactly the same as I had before taking the formula. I was just built like a tall, lanky Brazilian volleyball player. My clothes hung off of my new frame as if they belonged to someone much bigger and much shorter at the same time. Looking in the mirror, I couldn't believe that it was me staring back. I was tall, I was sexy, I was beautiful. I would have Galen back, there was no way he could resist me. But then, from out of nowhere, an evil thought crept into my brain. Fuck Galen, I could have any man I wanted. I wasn't sure anymore that Galen even loved me. He'd been too eager to dump me over one mistake. Just as I got ready to slap myself for even thinking that, my body began to change in front of me. My limbs shortened and got thicker before my eyes. So did my waist. As I shrank, my tummy bulged over my waistline, disgusting me. My face became shorter and stouter, although still pretty. The contours were different. My body continued to change until my clothing fit me again. I looked at the clock in the corner of the room. The entire exchange had taken only 10 minutes and I was exhausted. I felt as if I had just run a marathon, although all I had done was to stand in front of the mirror. I needed to alter the formula more, but at that moment, I could barely walk, let alone drive back to the lab. But at the same time, I was ecstatic. The test I had just done proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that I was on to something. Given a few more months to finesse and finalize my formula, I could make millions, perhaps billions. But all I really wanted was to have Galen back. But now, with the success of my formula, I began to see that as a distinct possibility. For the first time since we broke up, I could see it happening. It was just a matter of time now. Oh yeah, Galen. Oh yeah, screamed the body under me as I pistoned in and out of the tightest, warmest pussy I had ever been inside of. I reached around her torso and grabbed her breasts. I tweaked her nipples even as the sperm threatened to release itself. Oh fuck, I yelled. I'm gonna cu- Her hands reached back and grabbed my dick. With expert skill, she squeezed the base of my dick, somehow preventing my eruption. She started throwing her ass back against me and I slammed into her with even more furious strokes. My entire body felt as if I was buzzing as she held me there on the precipice. Then she stiffened herself, and as her hand fell away, she choked out one syllable. Now, now, baby. Come for me, Galan. I erupted like a volcano. I filled her with what seemed like a gallon of sperm. I could feel her pussy fluttering and clutching at my dick as it pulsed. Each pulse was weaker and gushed less of the thick fluid. I could feel my heart beating and my brain winking with each release until finally a sense of calm overtook my body. I knew that she could feel it too. Her hand snaked its way towards mine and when it found it, latched onto it. We were both spent, but our bodies pulled themselves towards each other. We were sweaty, sticky, and stinky but neither of us cared. She pulled a blanket over us and we drifted off to the sleep of the damned or the truly blessed. I could never tell which. The only thing I felt was bliss. It was the best sex I had ever experienced. It was hard to reconcile the fact that my 55-year-old work colleague and now roommate was the best piece of ass I'd ever had. Glory, out of her functional yet well-fitted business attire, was built like a brick shipyard. She was slim, yet curvy. Her breasts, while much smaller than Beth's, seemed to be too large for her frame. Her ass was firm and rounded from hours of Zumba, yoga, and aerobics classes, yet still soft and warm. I love you, Glory, I mumbled before I lost consciousness. Don't ever say that, she snapped. You just love fucking me, and you can. You can fuck my pussy, my mouth, my ass, or anything else you want. 
Behind closed doors, you can dress me up or treat me like your own personal sleut, Galan. However, you and I will never be in love. I'm old enough to be your mother for one thing, and the real reason is that I'm already in love. I sat straight up in the bed. I was shocked. I didn't understand any of it. So, so, I was married once, she said. I was married to a guy who was a lot like you, Galen. He was a real up-and-comer. The problem was that he wasn't up-and-coming for me. He loved his job more than his family. I ended up leaving him and filing for a divorce. Can you believe it took the bastard almost a week before he even noticed that we were gone? I saw a tear roll down her cheek. I could tell that this was hard for her, so I wrapped my arms around her. I never thought that we'd end up divorced, she said. Yeah, I know that I was the one who filed. But I always thought that he would see what he stood to lose and would come after me to stop the divorce. But he never did. I guess he loved his job more than he loved me. Then why can't we ca- I began. Because Galen, I'm exactly what you want, she said sadly. I'm a one-man woman, and as much as I like you, in my own way, maybe I even love you a little. However, as long as my man is out there somewhere, as long as he's breathing, I'll never belong to anyone else. My face fell, and without either one of us moving, it was as if we were suddenly miles away from each other. My disappointment was written all over my face. She hugged me tightly. Gallon, honey, just take what we have and be happy with it. You never know how much time you have with anyone or anything. And as far as things between us go, who knows how much time we have. We may have many years together or only a few more moments. However, for as long as we have, I'm yours alone, she said. Even as she said it, I felt a sense of unease creep over me. I got the feeling that strange times were coming. The next day was a Thursday. We went to work as usual, and while at work, kept everything professional. About an hour before lunchtime, she called me and asked where I was and what I was doing. I told her that I was on my way back into the office, and I had just closed another sale. I landed a fairly large privately owned chain of drugstores in a nearby city. The owner of the chain had a son, who was a doctor, and was interested in speaking to me as well. The good thing was that he was already one of our customers. He was one of Brent's accounts, and felt that he wasn't getting the best deal possible. I loved sticking it to Brent, and after what he and the others had cost me, who could blame me? Are you going to be anywhere near the office at lunchtime? She asked. I can be, I said. I know that what we talked about last night upset you, she said. And I wanted you to know that I do care for you. However, I really need to be honest with you. So can I make it up to you with a lunchtime blowjob? If you really want to make it up to me, I'd rather have a nighttime dinner, I said. It doesn't have to be in our area. We can go somewhere out of town, where no one knows us. You'd rather have dinner in a restaurant than get your dick sucked? She asked in surprise. Okay, I'll get my hair done at lunchtime. That way, I'll look nice for you. Glory, you always look nice, I said, hanging up. I didn't care what Glory had told me. I didn't care about our age difference or that she thought she was in love with her ex-husband. Glory was mine. I just needed to convince her that we could work. In order to do that, we needed time together. And we needed time when we weren't fucking each other's brains out. Sex could only carry you so far. We met at the restaurant. I dressed very nicely in my favorite blue suit. The valet guy couldn't wait to get his hands on my Mustang. Once I took a look at him, I decided to park it myself. Cheap bastard, he mumbled thinking I couldn't hear him. Your mother, I replied cheerfully. Several women looked at me as I stepped inside. Glory had taken a taxi so we could drive home together. I noticed that she was already there and waiting for me at the bar. As she walked over to me, every eye was on us. Glory looked amazing. Her dress looked like she was poured into it. Her new hairstyle was flirtatious without being slutty. She was teetering on the highest heels I had ever seen her wear, but she still managed to look as if she was walking in flats. Have you been waiting long, Glory? I asked. I just got here too, she said. I took her hand and we followed a hostess over to our table. The dinner was perfect. As we stared into each other's eyes, 
I was sure that I was making progress with her. Our waitress was attentive and kept our glasses full. She spent most of the evening staring at me. Remember what I said about us enjoying what time we have? Asked Glory. Yep, I said crisply. I think Glory understood that I was still not happy with that. Well, I know that you don't like it, and I know that you also don't understand it yet, she said, but someday you will, and it's for your own good, but for tonight, you're all mine, and I'm about to teach that little bitch a lesson. She finished her glass of wine, and the waitress appeared out of nowhere with the bottle. As she poured the beverage into Glory's glass, Glory spoke to me. Do you know what would be the perfect ending for this wonderful evening? She asked. Tell me what you think it would be, I said. I think the perfect cap on this evening would be for you to take me home and fuck me until neither one of us can move, she said nastily. The tone to her voice indicated just how much she wanted it. The bottle slipped out of the woman's hands and the wine spilled on the table ruining the white tablecloth with a large red stain. Glory continued undaunted. I think you should start out by fucking my ass, and then I'll suck you hard again, and you can just pound the shit out of my pussy. And then, we'll take a shower together to get rid of the sweat, while we take a little break. Maybe we could have a light snack. Then we'll get back into bed, and you can give me some of that gentle lovemaking. You know the way you always want to do it. I love it when you kiss me and just move in and out of me slowly and gently so it takes forever for us to come. The waitress just stood there with the red wine pouring out of the bottle all over the floor. The head waiter ran over and grabbed the bottle. I noticed an almost 50% discount on our check as we left. Every man between 20 and 60 stared at Glory's ass as we left the restaurant. When we got home, Glory amazed me again. Before I could even close the door, she was moving. She grabbed the hemline of her dress and pulled it over her head, revealing the fact that she was totally naked under it. Gotta obey the house rules, she smirked. I know you remember the one about how your slut is supposed to always be naked when we're alone. She dropped to her knees there in the living room and crawled over to me. She unbuttoned my fly and dropped my pants around my ankles. She took my dick in her mouth and crossed her arms behind her back. She bobbed her head back and forth, engulfing more of my shaft with each jerking movement. It took three movements for her to bury her nose in my pubic hair. Then she started humming. It felt too good. I was ready to settle in and come right then, but she stopped me. She took her mouth off of me, looked up, and smiled at me. It looks like someone is as hard as a rock already, she smirked. She used one hand to hold my dick while she licked my balls with her tongue. I wish we had more time for this, she crooned. Maybe later, we do have a schedule to keep. Remember what I told you in the restaurant? All I could do was to nod. Glory was in her glory. She reached into a drawer in the end table and pulled out a tube of lube. I thought I heard something, but I didn't care. Glory rubbed the grape-flavored liquid all over my dick and then handed it to me. Lube me up, baby, she hissed. She bent herself over the arm of the couch with her magnificent ass into the air. I dropped to my knees behind her and started licking her pussy and her ass from behind. I pulled her ass cheeks apart and licked my way around her ass while slowly pushing one then two fingers in her pussy. Oh, Galen, she moaned. If you keep that up, we won't need the lube. I'm glad I took that dress off. I paid too much money for it to ruin it the first time I wore it. I continued my work behind her. I was sure I'd seen something out of the corner of my eye, but I was so turned on that again, I didn't care. Galen, baby, don't make me come yet. I want you in me, take me right now, she hissed. I stood up and pulling her cheeks apart, I rubbed the lubed up head of my dick against her anus. We both moaned at the contact. I had been in her ass before many times, so it didn't take much pressure. I still had to go very slowly at first, and I paused right after the head popped past her sphincter. Aye, she sighed. Go slowly, baby, take your time. After a few strokes, she was wailing for me to pound that ass. A few minutes later, I was bent over her with my left hand squeezing one of her tits and my other rubbing her tummy. I was slamming it to her as hard as I could, and she was pushing her ass back at me just as hard. The sound of our bodies slapping together could be heard all over the house. Ooh, shit, she moaned. That's it, baby. Rub my tummy. Are you going to make mama pregnant? Are you trying to knock me up, Galen? Are you trying to put your babies in my tummy? 
That was when the train went off the rails. If he is trying to knock you up, he's doing the wrong hole, mother, she said. Both Glory and I froze in place as the lights came on, and the most beautiful woman I had ever seen stood there on the stairs. Our jaws dropped open, and our eyes opened wider than dinner plates at the sudden intrusion. We had both been trying to hold off our orgasms and lost control at the very second. I flooded Glory's insides involuntarily and slumped behind her in shock. My warm, sticky goo coated Glory's colon, and she had a huge orgasm too. We slumped to the floor together in spasms that were totally beyond our control. The woman on the stairs also went into shock. Her jaw dropped and her eyes bored into my skull. As quickly as I could, I snatched Glory's dress off of the couch and used it to cover her nakedness as well as I could. Save it, cowboy, she smirked. I've seen my mother naked more times than I care to mention. Perhaps you should cover yourself up, though. And maybe you might want to think about going home before this gets any more weird than it already is. Um, I kind of live here, I said. Seriously, mother? She said. I thought you told me that you had taken in a roommate. You never mentioned adopting a child. Grace, he's hardly a child, snapped Glory. You're a full-grown woman, and he's only a couple of years younger than you are. I quickly vacated the room so they could talk. There were several times when I heard raised voices, but I couldn't make out what they were talking about. Glory did pop her head into the bedroom a couple of times to check on me. Why the hell did you get dressed? She asked. We're not done. We're just on pause, Galen. I fell asleep waiting for them to finish their conversation. Towards the end, what they were arguing over became clear. Apparently, Grace, who called me a child, was still in college and not doing very well. She had been supposed to graduate a few weeks prior, but was lacking quite a few classes. I woke up the next morning to find Glory, and I spooned together as usual. She murmured in her sleep as I untangled my legs from hers. Five minutes later, I was ready to go out for my run in the early October morning chill. Sneaking out, asked Grace. Of course, she was sleeping on the couch. The second bedroom was supposedly mine although I hadn't actually used it since the third week that I had been here. I turned the light on so she could see me. Nope, just going out for my run, I said. You run? She asked. I just nodded. Can I go? She asked. I nodded again. I busied myself in the kitchen while she quickly changed. I noticed that her running gear imitated mine. We drove my Mustang to the park. I started out at a very slow pace as usual. You don't stretch? She asked. A lot of studies have shown that stretching before a run promotes injury, I said. I warm up by running slowly then as my muscles warm up. I increase the pace. I stretch after the run to help me stay flexible and to recover from the run. In the summer or when it's warm, I stretch by the car. On cold days like this morning, I do it back at the house while I make Glory's breakfast. We talked while we ran and after a couple of miles, we had increased the pace until I could tell that it was challenging for her to maintain. I backed off a bit so she'd be able to complete the run. When we got back to the house, she hit the shower immediately. I hit the kitchen. I started the coffee and put bread in the toaster. I made eggs the way Glory liked them and cut up some fruit. I went into the bedroom and kissed Glory awake before setting the tray down on her bed. I went back to get the coffee and found Grace there staring at me. Good bacon! She said. Eat the eggs too, I said. I made them for you. I figured that you'd probably like them the way Glory does. But there won't be enough for you, she said. I hate eggs, I said. Just the smell of them makes me sick. Then why... She asked in confusion. Because Glory loves them, I smiled. She got a plate and sat down on the edge of the bed, munching along with her mother as I got into the shower. Mom, is he putting on a show for me? Asked Grace when I was out of the room. Nope, said Glory. He makes me breakfast almost every morning, and he does more than his share of the housework too. He's a good guy, Grace. I know, damn it, spat Grace. This is really fucked up. Beth. A week before Halloween, everything changed. My plan was to show up at the company Halloween party and use the formula to win Galen back but setback after setback in terms of being able to extend the length of time that it was active had me changing my plans. 
In order for the formula to work the way I needed it to, the effects had to last at least a couple of hours or so. All I had succeeded in doing so far was to increase the active time to nine or ten minutes. I ran into Galen that day too. We were in the parking lot. He was getting out of our Mustang, just as I was getting out of my car. Hi, Galen, I said with as much cheer and enthusiasm as I could muster. Look, Beth, he said, you already ruined my life. I'm glad you're happy and you got over us so easily. However, can you give me a break? I'm just not that goddamn cheerful yet, okay? I smiled, not because I was happy about Galen being miserable, although I was happy that he was miserable. It only proved that he still loved me and that getting over me was tough for him. The real reason I smiled was because with the way that he was feeling, I was sure my plan would work. I was also sure that I probably didn't even need the formula. Galen had always loved me the way I was. My day was routine. I spent most of my time in the lab. I did a lot of normal chemical analysis and testing. I mixed a batch of a new drug that our research department had come up with. I went out into the office a couple of times, but only if I absolutely had to. Lately I have taken to doing all of my office work and ordering just after the office workers left for the day. That way, I wasn't subjected to the hundreds of little digs that they took at me. Avoiding the fat jokes and comments about how I lost Galen was worth staying a few minutes later. No. However, as I've mentioned, it was about a week before Halloween that it all came apart. I was heading for Todd's office to leave my order list on his desk when Craig cornered me. Since Galen had caught us, I had always made sure to keep my body totally covered. It had been my joy at Galen's love for my body that had caused me to go around displaying all of that cleavage in the first place. Galen's love had convinced me that bigger women could be sexy too. However, the only thing being sexy had gained me was more attention, and it was all the wrong kind of attention. And it came from the wrong people. Hey, fat ass, smirked Craig. I've noticed that you're covering all of that fat up lately. I didn't bother with a reply. I guess your wimpy boyfriend isn't going to do anything about us fucking you, he laughed. I was scared for a while that he was going to tell our wives and tell the old man, but all he did was dump you. I guess even wimps don't want a big fat slut like you. I was very close to tears. There was nothing I could do about it. We were alone in the office. Even if I made a report, it would be his word against mine. I'll bet that fat pussy is as dry as the desert, he laughed. Tell you what, as a favor to you, I'm going to fuck it for you one more time. Get into Todd's office now. No, I said sharply. Never again. I won't cheat on Galen again. You must be the dumbest fat slut on the planet, he sneered. You can't cheat on Galen. He dumped your fat ass. But if you're so worried about him, how hurt do you think he'd be if I emailed him a couple of the videos of you sucking and fucking the three of us? No, don't do that, I said. Then get your fat ass in that office and pull those tits out and those panties down, he said. I had no choice. Just as I started towards the office, something changed. My tears stopped flowing. It wasn't that I wanted to have sex with Craig. It was that I had a reason for it. I was going to let Craig have me to prevent doing further harm to Galen. There was nothing I wouldn't do for Galen. Craig's phone rang at that moment and he answered it while pointing towards the office. So while Craig jabbered away on his phone, I pulled the vial out of my pocket and took a large gulp of my formula. Even as Craig followed me into the office, my body changed. All Craig noticed was that I pulled my hair out of its bun. He hadn't noticed the change in my height as much because I was walking. I bent over Todd's desk and slipped my now two large panties off as Craig stepped up behind me. He ripped away my lab coat and gasped at the changes. The smile on his face was priceless. Holy fuck, he gasped. Have you been working out? You're fucking gorgeous. We might have to make a habit of this. Suddenly, he couldn't wait to get his dick into me. He was also much gentler with me. He stroked my breasts and tried to get me aroused. When he did penetrate me, it was almost lovingly. He started stroking in and out of my pussy, softly yet firmly. You like that baby? He asked. And to tell the truth, I did. I felt guilty about it because it wasn't Galen, but it felt good. I was a young, healthy woman who was used to an above average amount of sex. 
In some ways, it was Galen's fault that I enjoyed it. After all, it had been Galen that had fucked me every day while we were together. My body was used to having a lot of sex, and it was enjoying it whether I felt guilty or not. Sure, I was angry at Craig for forcing me to do this, but I really didn't mind him fucking me. It felt really good. I was feeling warm all over. I really thought that it was the sex. I was feeling so warm and so powerful. I felt more powerful than ever before. I started pushing my body back against Craig and then... Nothing. Galen. Things had been really strange since Grace came to stay with us. I didn't know how to put my finger on it, but there was a very strange dynamic going on between the three of us. I just wanted things to go back to the way they were before Grace came. She seemed to put a cramp in the way things had been. For one thing, Glory couldn't very well run around the house naked with Grace there. I also couldn't fuck her any time I felt like it, in any room of the house, and that didn't mean that Glory didn't do her best to reduce me to a pile of boneless flesh every night in the privacy of our room, though. However, there were signs that we might have to give up even that. What does that feel like? Grace asked Glory one morning. What does what feel like? asked Glory. You know, when he fucks your booty hole, asked Grace sheepishly. It's, um, different, said Glory. Not every woman likes it. You have to get used to it. Well, you obviously do, said Grace. Did you do that with Daddy? Honey, I barely had sex with your Daddy. I barely had conversations with your Daddy, spat Glory. He was too into his fucking job to even think about fucking me. Is that why you cheated on him? asked Grace. Glory looked as if she had been slapped. Tears rolled down her face, and suddenly everything was different. Glory finally looked. Her age. Her face fell and her confidence with it. Lines appeared on her face that had never been there before. Glory looked like a nearly 60-year-old woman. And before I even knew that I was moving, I was. She went to put her beautiful head down on the table and never made it. I was suddenly between them, hugging Glory for all I was worth. Grace shrank back from the fury in my eyes. For what seemed like a very long time, no one moved and nothing was said. Then Glory squeezed my hand. She turned and patted me on my wrist. Within seconds, she breathed, and then my Glory came back. She shook her head, and the lines on her face disappeared. Her confidence came back, and with it, her smile. Grace, I never cheated on your father, she said finally. I'm sure that he thinks I did, but it never happened. There are two ways to look at this. The first is because your father actually gave me permission. He what? said Grace. He told me that I could go out and find a man and have sex with him, said Glory. I was always after him for sex, and we never did it. I don't know if he lost interest in sex in general, or just in sex with me. But finally, he told me that if it was that important to me just to go out and do it, he told me to be discreet and never tell him about it. So under those conditions, what I did can't be considered cheating. Grace just sat there with her mouth open. So, um, what's the second reason that you didn't cheat? She asked. Because I didn't actually do anything, said Glory. I started dressing up and going out in the evening. Your father noticed me going out and never said anything. What he finally found out, though, was that although I wasn't actually doing what he thought I was doing, I was doing something. For the first few nights, I went to the movies, alone, or I went and visited with old friends. Grace, I never had sex with anyone, as much as I wanted to. I was hoping that your father would get jealous and tell me to stop. I just needed to know that he cared, or he wanted me. What I really wanted was for him to claim me and tell me that I was his woman, and if anyone was going to fuck me, it would be him. It never happened, so I used those evenings to meet with my lawyer and served your father with divorce papers. Even then, Grace, it wasn't too late. I thought that he would sit down, talk to me, and try to save our marriage and our family. He never did. When he was served, he didn't even bat an eyelash. The normal thing is for the person served to be shocked or to complain. They usually go out and get a lawyer. More than anything else, they talk to their spouse and ask them, why? Not your father. 
He looked over the papers, saw that it was the usual 50-50, sell the house, each keeps our own cars and retirement packages type of divorce. Then he got out a pen, signed the papers, and gave them back to the process server. When he got home from work that evening, he packed a couple of bags and told me goodbye. I always suspected that he had another woman on the side. I hired a PI just to find out. I wasted my money. It took them a month of watching him before they even felt guilty about taking my money. There was no other woman. Your father moved on as if we had never been married. He put all of his time and effort fully into his job then. I, of course, was devastated. It took me years to get over him. I snorted loudly when she said that, and Grace looked at me. We went on about our business after that. That evening when Glory and I got into bed, she surprised me. Galen, I'm sorry, honey, but I'm just not feeling it tonight. It was the first time in a long time that we didn't have some kind of sex. There was a big thunk as the handcuffs I had hidden under the covers fell to the floor and I just settled down to sleep. Galen, she said into the darkness, could you still hold me? I moved over closer to her and wrapped my arms around her. She sighed contentedly. Grace, everything was just fucked up. For the past few years, I'd had one thing in my mind. Even though I was an adult woman at 27 years old, I wanted what all kids want. I wanted my parents back together. The college I'd attended was relatively close to the house I'd grown up in. My dad still lived there, so we'd spent a lot of time together. I spent a lot of time talking to him. It took me a long time to break through his hesitance to talk about his marriage to my mom. The funny thing about it was that he always maintained that she had cheated on him. After so many years of hearing it from him, I had really begun to believe that my mother had cheated on him. I believed that my mother was some sort of deranged slut that had broken my father's heart after more than 20 years of marriage because she couldn't keep her legs closed. However, after talking to her and hearing her side of things, I was taken aback. I knew from the way she looked when she told me her side of things that she was telling the truth. I also knew from the way she talked about him that she still loved my father. And since I had grown up around my dad, I realized that perhaps neither one of them were to blame. They were just two people who loved each other, who somehow got out of sync. My dad was a few years older than mom. He'd had a heart attack about a year ago and was going to retire later this year. He dreaded it and had all sorts of regrets about the way things between he and mom had ended. I knew that he would leap at the chance to have her back. This caused a huge problem for me. My real reason for being here, for being back in mom's life, was to see if the unrepentant slut that I thought she was had learned her lesson and could be coerced back into her husband's life and trained to be a good wife. Now I realized that my mother was simply a woman, and like most women, she needed to be loved and cared for. The problem was that my mom was already being loved and cared for. When I first saw her and Gallon together, I was shocked. Who watches their mother crawl naked across the floor and give a guy a no-hands blowjob and comes away unscarred? Not me, for sure. Who watches their mother getting fucked in the ass and enjoying it and walks away from the experience without being changed? Again, that's not me. From that first night, I was torn by Galen and very confused. Galen was pretty. There is simply no other way to describe the man. At the same time, the things he made my mother do both revolted me and intrigued me. At first, I was determined to get my mother away from him. I knew that I had to be very subtle about it. My mother had always been very headstrong. That was probably where I got my determination from. I knew that if I just told her to kick him out of her life, they would probably end up married. I was sure that my mom was just being used. The next few days were a revelation. I found out that not only was Galen not freeloading off of my mom, but he was a great help. He not only paid her rent to stay with her, he paid a lot of the household bills. He also did a lot of the chores and housework around the house. From talking to my mother, I found out that it had been she who asked him to move in with her. It had also been she who started them having sex. The more information I found out, the worse things got for me. First off, there was the fact that Galen spoiled my mother in ways that my father never had. He woke up early just to make her breakfast when he didn't have to show up for work until he felt like it. He also spent most of his time and effort on my mother. The amount of attention he paid her was ridiculous. 
I was nowhere near shocked when my mother told me that Galen had told her that he loved her. I could believe it. It was apparent in his every action. I was further shocked when my mother confessed to me that the only reason that she held herself back from allowing herself to fall for Galen in return was the lingering love she had for my father. I love my father, but I had to admit that my mother would be a fool to go back to him. My grand plans and schemes were now up in the air because I simply couldn't bring myself to do anything to hurt Galan. In fact, the more time I spent with him, the more I realized that Galan was probably going to end up hurt one way or another in this situation. If my parents got back together, he'd be the one left out. If he stayed with my mother, he'd be the one to lose out because he had stars in his eyes when he looked at her. Galen would never willingly walk away from that kind of love. So as my mother aged, he would match his activity level to hers, and even though he had her, he would miss out on a lot of things in life that she had already done. My mother was far too old to have children. That meant that a man as loving as Galen was would never share that love with his own offspring. That in itself was a crime. The more I found out about Galen, the worse things got. I found out later that Galen wasn't some kind of freak with a fetish for older women. He'd gotten out of a relationship with a woman who was his age only a few weeks before he and my mom moved in together. I stopped by my mom's job to take her to lunch once and got a look at the woman who Galen had been hurt by. She was a fat girl, but a really pretty one. She seemed to be pretty broken up by losing him too. I guess in most people's minds, the easy way out of my situation would have been to reunite Galen with his former girlfriend. Then I could go about getting my parents back together and everything would be right with the world. The problem was that I had someone else in mind for Galan. After all, the woman had been stupid enough to cheat on Galan, so she clearly didn't deserve him. And every day that I spent with Galan convinced me more of that fact. For a man of his age, he was very astute when it came to life in general and women in particular. Galen loved women. However, he limited himself to one at a time. We talked a lot while we ran in the mornings. I once asked him why the hell he had fallen for my mother when she was more than twice his age. My mom, at a little over 30 years older than Galen, was close to being too old to be his mother. She was almost grandma range. If my mother had gotten pregnant at 15 and her daughter had done likewise, my mom could be Galen's grandmother. Galen told me that beauty doesn't have an age or a shelf life. My mother had been very beautiful when she was young. That beauty still survived. She aged well and was still very pleasant to look at. She had also taken care of herself and was so active that they did a lot of things. I saw that for myself. My mom and Galen went everywhere. They went to apple orchards and for walks in the park. They went to movies and out to dinner often. They seemed to have the opinion that no new restaurant in town could officially be considered open for business until the two of them had been there. They had a list on the refrigerator of the places they loved and another for the places they hated. As far as Beth was concerned, Galen in an unguarded moment told me that Beth was beautiful too. He talked about her large body as if she was some sort of Rubenesque goddess. I could tell from the way that he spoke and almost broke down that he had loved her immensely. One of the things that had originally disgusted me was my mother and Galen's sex life. She had told me about the rules he had put down for her and I had been shocked. But the more I thought about it, the more intrigued I became. His insistence that she never wear clothes around the house when they were alone together fascinated me. And some of the things they did together sexually were things that I had never considered. Neither apparently had my mother until she tried them. As we'd spoken, I got the idea that my mother had an inkling that my feelings towards Galan were changing or already changed. Beth, when I woke up Friday morning, I was confused. I didn't remember coming home. I didn't remember getting into bed. I made myself a cup of strong coffee and tried to remember what had happened. I had brief flashes of disjointed memories but no cohesive idea about what had happened the day before. Son I remembered grabbing my clothes in the middle of the night. I vaguely remembered getting into my car. I don't remember the drive home, but the evidence clearly shows that I made it. I had a splitting headache and an attack of guilt and self-loathing. I remember taking the formula the day before, and I remember having sex with Craig, 
Or at least, I remember the beginning of having sex with Craig. I must have blacked out from guilt while he was fucking me. I couldn't believe that I had cheated on Galen yet again. He was right to have dumped me. I was some sort of whore. How the fuck was I going to get him back if I couldn't keep my goddamn legs together? The worst part was that since I had spread my legs for Craig, it would only be a matter of time before he told his friends, and then they would be bending me over desks and fucking me in closets all over the building. I decided then and there that I would have a backbone this time. I would never have sex with anyone again until things were fully resolved with Galen. I quickly dressed and headed for work, with my head feeling as if a thousand monkeys were playing a drum solo inside of my cranium. I got several ugly looks as I stepped into the building's parking structure. I had parked my car sideways, blocking several of the other residents in their spots. I must have been drunk when I parked. Maybe Craig drugged me. That was probably why I let him fuck me in the first place. I didn't think it was my formula, because I'd taken it plenty of times with no ill effects. I decided to give Craig a piece of my mind when I got to work. A few moments later, I arrived at the building full of piss and vinegar. I had worked out exactly what I was going to say to Craig, and none of it was nice. I noticed that the parking lot had been sectioned off and there was a really large crowd, watching several ambulances and police cars. After I parked in the section, they still allowed us to use, I walked over to one of my co-workers which was watching what was going on. It was that woman Glory that Galen was friendly with. Talking to her would be a good thing. Maybe I could get some information about Galen from her after I found out what was going on. When I walked up next to her, she noticed me and started talking. Glory always had an expression of pity in her face when she saw me. I once thought that it was because she understood what losing Galen had felt like for me. However, now almost three months later I realized that maybe she just felt sorry for me because I was fat. My God, it's horrible, she said. What's horrible, I asked. Yeah. Do you see that thing over there and the one over there and those smaller piles over there? She asked. I looked to where she was pointing. There were several objects over a small area of the parking lot that were covered by sheets. Each object had a forensics team gathered around them, taking pictures and measurements. There were also people measuring the distances between the objects and taking pictures of the ground or something on the ground. So I nodded to let her know that I had seen what she was talking about. That used to be Craig, she said. My stomach lurched, and I had to fight to keep its contents contained. Apparently something, perhaps some kind of escaped animal got to Craig before he made it to his car, she said. As we watched a small bent over shriveled up woman was being led over to the area around one of the piles. I didn't know her name, but I had seen her at some of the company's parties. I recognized her now as Craig's wife. She broke into tears and started screaming hysterically as they showed her one of the objects. I was confused. I had assumed that the large object was Craig's body and the rest were his property, like his briefcase and other things he carried. From what we've heard, continued Glory, whatever did this to him bit a big ass chunk out of his neck and ripped his arms and legs off. There are parts of Craig scattered all over the parking lot and there are still some parts they haven't found yet. I passed out then. Grace. It wasn't fair. After a few weeks of running with Galen, I had gotten to the point where I loved our runs. So that morning, I was in a good mood. As we settled down to run the last mile, I was up for a challenge. Winner gets to ask the loser any question that she wants, and he has to answer it truthfully, I said. You're on. He laughed as I took off running. I had gotten the jump on him, and I looked back to see that he was just standing there. I thought for a moment that he had twisted his ankle or something, but then he started running. I was running a bit faster than we normally ran together, but Galen was gaining ground on me as if I was standing still. He continued to gain ground until he was even with me, and then he loped past me, galloping ahead as easily as a gazelle outpaces a tortoise. It was simply unfair. I already knew the question that I wanted answered. It had been driving me crazy for weeks. It was a Friday morning a week before Halloween and one week from then was my endgame. I had to find a way to save Galen from the pain he would go through if I was successful. He was simply too good a guy to have his heart broken twice in the same year. The way that he answered my question would have a big effect on everything. But as he ran away from me, seemingly without effort, 
I knew I'd need to come up with another way to find out what I needed to know. When I got back to his car, he was smiling as he waited for me. So do you have to answer a question for me? He asked. I just nodded. His smile made him seem like a big puppy. He was happy, playful, and eager to please. The man obviously had no idea of his effect in women. What can I do to get your mom to like me more? He asked. You're doing fine, Galen, I said. Any woman in her right mind would love the amount of attention you pay my mom. I didn't have the heart to tell him the truth. We went home and stopped off to get fresh blueberry muffins and coffee for breakfast. We had seen a commercial on TV the night before advertising Tim Horton's blueberry muffins, and my mom had mentioned wanting to try them. Apparently, my mom's wish was Galan's command, but at least he bought me breakfast too. The three of us had breakfast together before mom headed off to work. She called us less than an hour later and told Galen that one of their co-workers had been killed by some sort of wild animal in the parking lot. What surprised me was the way that Galen took it. He left for work early so he could make sure my mom was okay. Galen, did you know this guy Craig too? I asked. Yep, he said. He's in sales like me. Well, are you upset about him dying? I asked. Nope, fuck him, he was an asshole, said Galen cheerfully. I just need to make sure Glory is all right. The more he talked about my mother like she was some sort of saint, the more jealous I became. Galen, I'm not working right now and you're really busy, I said. I'm trying to convince my mom to go to your company's Halloween party next Friday evening. It's a costume party. Should I go out and get you a costume when I pick up hers? That would be great, he said. I had forgotten about the party. I wasn't even sure that Glory wanted to go. She's really weird about people we work with knowing anything about us. Okay, I'll call you from the costume shop and let you know what you have to choose from, I said. I was thinking about how easy this was going to be. Beth, for the last few days I'd been having some sort of dreams or flashbacks. They were awful. All I saw in them was blood cascading down over a man's body. I felt like some sort of vampire because while I was having those dreams, I could almost taste the blood. I put it all behind me though and went back to work. After only two days, everyone seemed to have gotten over Craig's death. Or at least they'd written it off as a bizarre occurrence that would probably never happen again. The one good thing about it was that with everyone thinking about Craig, no one had time to worry about picking on me. And through it all, it was business as usual at the lab. There were a lot of people, including Brent, talking about the fact that there was virtually no way of stopping Galen from becoming the new sales manager. Galen was simply a drug-selling machine. He also sold the company's other products, including wraps, bandages, supports, and other therapeutic devices. Brent was claiming that Galen had not only simply taken over all of Craig's clients, he was making inroads on some of Brent's clients as well. I knew why he was doing it. It was Galen's way of getting back at them for the way they had ruined our relationship. It made me feel really good. Two months after our breakup and Galen was still not over me. I wondered how long he would stay angry at me. He wasn't dating anyone, I knew that for a fact. It was actually worse than not dating anyone. I heard from the grapevine that Galen had moved in with Gloria. It was almost like moving in with his mother. I was sure that all I had to do was to give him some time and some gentle persuasion. If things went my way, I could get Galen back. All I had to do was wait. In the meantime, I was constantly working on my formula. I wanted to find a way to make the changes last longer. In a perfect world, the changes would be more controllable and permanent, but a drug company wouldn't really want the effects to be permanent. Perfect as a product would mean that the effects only lasted a day or two. That way, customers would have to keep buying the formula. I mostly worked on the formula after work, so the tap on my shoulders was a big surprise. I turned to find Todd standing behind me. He had a nervous look on his face. Beth. During all of the drama with... What happened to Craig? Somehow the police never interviewed you, he said. Why would they have wanted to talk to me, I asked. Because you were the last person to see him alive, he said. What makes you think that? I asked. He looked around nervously. Only three people have keys to my office, he said. I've spoken to Brent. 
He hasn't used my office since, um, since Galen caught us. So that only left Craig. And on the night he was killed, he was in my office with someone before he left here. Okay, Sherlock, maybe he was. What does that have to do with me? I asked. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a pair of panties. They were very obviously mine. I think we should talk about this, he said. I'll be in my office. I put down the vial of chemicals I'd been testing. I cleaned up my lab and went to his office. On the way there, I took a gulp of my formula. I figured that Fat Beth wouldn't have a chance of negotiating with Todd, but maybe Hot Beth could. It was strange, the formula hadn't quite taken effect when I walked into his office. I had made some progress. The effects came on smoother. In fact, I was growing and changing in front of Todd. But since he was so busy looking at his desk as he spoke to me, he never noticed it. Beth, you're a nice girl, he muttered. I hate what we did to you and Galen. You just need to have a little bit of faith. He'll forgive you. You know it wasn't supposed to be like that. What you and I started was a lot more innocent and it never would have... But it did, I said. You all got lucky. You all got off scot-free. Galen didn't go to your wives, and he didn't go to the old man. The only ones who lost were Galen and me. So what the fuck do you want, Todd? He looked up at me in shock. He had never heard me swear before. And when he looked up, he didn't see Fat Beth. He saw Hot Beth. His mouth dropped open. B. B. Beth. He stammered. You, you look different. I've been working out, I smirked. I felt invincible. I walked around the big desk, closing the space between us. How about this, I said. His eyes were huge and so was the tent in his pants. I'll give you one more for the road, but you have to promise me that everything between us goes no further. I crooned. My voice was as smooth as honey. Uh, uh, okay, he said as I pulled my blouse open. How do you want me, I asked. Could we start with a blowjob? He asked. I dropped to my knees in front of him. I fished into his pants and pulled out his dick. It was the worst possible thing he could have asked for. He was already so excited by my formula-enhanced body that he was about to pop at any second. My lips and tongue connected with his hypersensitive dick as my fingers stroked his engorged balls. Both of us were excited adrenaline flooded both of our systems. Raw testosterone in the form of sperm squirted from his dick into my mouth and down my throat. Todd's moment of euphoria was short-lived, as was Todd. I felt the changes in my body almost immediately. Due to the changes in the formula, I kept my consciousness this time I was there for the entire process. But I couldn't stop it. I was powerless to act as anything other than a witness. As the sperm went down my throat and entered my system, it mixed with the adrenaline I was making due to the excitement and danger of the situation. The potent mixture supercharged my already volatile and unstable formula and made huge changes in my body almost instantly. The first thing I noticed was the rage. Anger completely filled me. I hated Todd for what he had forced me to do. At the same time, I remembered that he had been one of the reasons that I was no longer with Galen. Todd had to die. Even as my conscious mind said no, something far more primal and far more in charge said yes. What the fuck? uttered Todd, a mixture of fear and shock coloring his features. Thick, black, wire-like hairs sprang from my arms and face. My arms thickened, and my legs did as well. I got even taller and bigger. I lunged for Todd, but he was far quicker on the uptake. He dove to get clear of me and scrambled to his feet. He ran out of the office into the deserted main room and onwards. He was screaming as he got to the main entrance, but there was no one there. Still quick on his feet, he remembered what had happened to Craig and realized that once I was out of the building, he would never be able to outrun whatever I was. So instead of going to the deserted parking lot, he ran out the front door instead of the rear door. He was hoping to make it to one of the close-by businesses or at least to get into close proximity with other people so someone might be able to help him. He was running for all he was worth for the gas station on the corner when I spotted him. As I got bigger and angrier, I apparently got stupider as well. It had taken me more than a few moments to get the door open, but once I got outside of the building, I made up the distance between us with almost blinding speed. I caught up to a screaming Todd, 
Just as he got to the gas station, he was screaming his lungs out for help. The people inside of the station were turning to point at him, at the same time that I leaped for him and tore open the backs of his legs with my claws. Yes, goddammit, I had claws. With his hamstring muscles and his calves shredded, Todd could no longer run. He turned to look at me as if begging for mercy. Please, he begged. For a fraction of a second, my conscious, rational mind debated with my primal urges and quickly lost. One of my huge hands grabbed Todd by his head and the other grabbed his upper arm. My jaws opened and I bit deeply into his neck, severing his jugular vein, his esophagus and his larynx. I shook my head and ripped his throat out. Blood was all over my face and body. The people on the gas station looked on in horror. I threw Todd's remains down and beat my chest in triumph. I roared at the sky as Todd's body jerked beside me, dying of in as I roared again in triumph. The people in the gas station were too shocked to move, then a little girl screamed in terror and started crying. That forced them to act, and one of them moved to lock the door to the station as if that could possibly have stopped me. The entire process from my secondary, change into the monster to Todd's death, had taken less than five minutes. I could feel lethargy and weakness tugging at me. I leaped away and disappeared into the darkness, even as I began to change back into a useless fat girl. Behind me, I could hear the people in the gas station yelling for someone to call the police as I headed back the way I came. By the time I got back to the lab, I was almost back to normal, useless fat Beth. I went around to the back of the building, got into my car and sat there feeling exhausted. There were still several cars in the parking lot. I was so physically drained that I knew there was no way I could drive home. I started the car and slowly drove out of the parking lot even as sirens closed in on the area. I saw the light from the first police cars as they pulled into the gas station, but I was almost a block away and heading away from them. I pulled into the parking lot behind an apartment building that was only five blocks away. I hoped that the police canvassing the area wouldn't make it that far. I also hoped that I could hide among all of the cars owned by the occupants of the building. I curled up on my back seat under my emergency blanket and went to sleep. When I awoke, my mouth tasted awful. Then I remembered what I or what whatever I had turned into had done. Strangely enough, I had no regrets. I still felt as if I had run the Boston Marathon with a piano on my back, but I was sure I could make it home. I turned on the stereo, looking to see if there was any news about what had happened. As soon as I touched the knob, music came out of the speakers. Everybody was born in it, sure as hell gonna die in it. Some people don't give a shit whether or not they're full of it. I started laughing as soon as I heard it. It was one of Galen's favorite songs. Galen had introduced me to metal. The music was raucous and heavy, but at the time, joyous and energetic. It's on my mind most of the time. That's when you find we all go blind. Then it will start to get in our hearts. It's gone too far, that's who we are. The song was from a band called Extreme. And this particular song, although written about sex, was ironically perfect for that evening and what had just happened to me. I chuckled as I sang along with the chorus. It's a monster we all have within us. It's a monster. It's a monster. Turns us into sinners. It's a monster. I played the song over and over during my drive home. It took me longer because I stayed off of the freeways and drove through deserted side streets with my lights off. If the police were looking for anyone, I wanted to be sure that I saw them before they saw me. I got home and went into my apartment through the back door. I wrapped the blanket around me in case I ran into anyone. But as luck would have it, probably because of the lateness of the hour, I got into my apartment without running into anyone. I showered several times and made sure that no traces of blood remained on me. I went downstairs into the building's incinerator and burned my clothes in the blanket. I would buy another emergency blanket the next day or so. I got into my bed and thought happy thoughts. It was as if my mind had made the connection, however wrongfully, between the assholes that cost me Galen and me reuniting with him. Even though one thing had nothing to do with the other, I just seemed to think that I had to get rid of the three of them for Galen to take me back. It was probably the formula warping my mind in the same way that it did my body. Galen. I was in serious trouble. 
Glory and I were as solid as ever. But I was spending a lot of my time thinking about Grace. There was no way that anything between us could ever happen. It would be just too weird to start something with Grace while I was screwing her mother. It was all a question of timing. If I had taken Glory up on any of the thousands of times she'd offered to hook me up with her daughter before we got together, everything would have been perfect. But now I was screwed. Even when Glory and I were having sex, I found myself wondering what Grace would feel like. And we had so much in common. We both liked to run. We liked all of the same foods and the same TV shows and music. It would have been perfect. Of course, there was no way that Grace would want to have anything to do with me. She spent most of her time trying to get me to leave her mother alone. She was convinced that if I went away, her parents could get back together. On the other hand, Glory didn't want me to leave. She was even harder to understand. She told me that she was never going to be in love with me, but every night we fucked like bunnies. I didn't understand any of it. We went in to work on Wednesday and found the police in our office. They wanted to talk to everyone and had pretty much set up some type of command post in the office. They were establishing some sort of timeline and map that detailed where everyone was after they left work the previous evening. At first they wouldn't tell us why, but then they got us all together to make an announcement. Another of your co-workers was killed last night, said the man in charge of the police officers. That immediately started everyone to talking among themselves. Don't worry, said the officer. No one here is a suspect. It was an animal attack. It was seen by several witnesses. The problem is that the attack was so sudden that the witnesses are unsure what kind of animal it was. Some of them thought it was a gorilla. Others are sure it was some sort of mutant bear. Judging from the injuries that were suffered in the attack, we think it's the same creature that attacked your other co-worker, Craig, last weekend. What we're trying to establish is the pattern the two of them had, and if there are any similar traits between them that could attract the creature. All we need is for you to answer our questions so we can figure those patterns out, and we'll try to catch this thing before it kills again. He stepped away, and several people started asking him questions. I didn't get a chance to talk to Grace because I had to go on several sales calls during the day. But when she got ready to leave for the day, I made sure that I was back at the office for once. Galan, honey, what are you doing here? She asked, keeping her voice low. She didn't want anyone to know about us, so she pretended that it was business. She grabbed several files off of her desk and handed them to me and then pretended to look them over for mistakes. I came to walk you to your car, I said. I'll follow you home. When we got to the house, she was still laughing. Grace asked her what was so funny and Grace told her. Remember when I called and told you that the bear or whatever it was got another one of our co-workers last night? She said to Grace. Grace just nodded her pretty head and had me almost gasping as waves of beautiful hair swished around with each nod. Galen came back to the office early just so he could escort me home. Isn't that funny? Laughed Glory. Grace immediately stopped laughing. It was almost as if she was angry at me. I just didn't understand women. One of them thinks I'm funny. The other gets pissed at me at the drop of a hat. If only this could be like those stories on the internet. Then I could have one of those three-way relationships with two women and marry both of them. But in real life, most men can't handle one woman. Only a fool would want two. Grace, we need to talk. It was funny because my mother and I had said it at the same time. We laughed as we stared at each other, and then we both started again. It's about Galen. We both said the exact same thing at the exact same time again. This time, though, she continued. Grace, I don't understand how the hell this happened, she said. I always thought that Galen would be perfect for you. When I asked him to move in with me, my thought was that the two of you would meet, and I'd end up with some grandkids. But somehow, he fell for me. I know all of the reasons why we don't work. I've done the math and come up with all of the correct answers, but somehow he still loves me. Grace, he treats me better than anyone in my life ever has. And that includes your father. He's kind. He's considerate. I'd be a fool not to take the chance at something like that. So tonight at the party, I'm not going to make a big announcement or anything, but the bullshit is out the door. I'm going to act the way I should. I'm going there with Gallen. Not as some big secret, but as the man in my life. Mom, you can't do that, I shrieked. Yeah, I can, she said. 
I'm tired of basing what I do on what other people think or like. If Galen and I are happy, so be it. But what about Daddy? I asked. Hi. Honey, I know this is hard for you, and your father was the love of my life. But I can't compete with his job. If it was another woman, I'd fight for him. But we've been divorced for more than three years now, and he's never even called me. I have the right to be happy, too. And Galen busts his ass trying to make me happy. I've tried to hold him off emotionally for just too long. Yeah, you've held him off emotionally, all right, I spat. But that's the only way you've held him off. She looked at me strangely. Grace, are you a virgin? She asked. Of course not, mother, I said. So how many guys have you slept with? She asked. Mother, that's kind of personal, I said. Is it more than three? She asked. Well, slightly, I said. How slightly? She asked. Okay, including disastrous one-night stands, it's probably five or six guys, I said. But that's over my entire life. Why do you want to know? Because you're trying to act like I'm some sort of whore, she said. Grace, you're 27 years old and you've slept with five or six guys. I'm 55 and I've been with two. Both were long-term relationships, one of which was a marriage. Mom, I'm not trying to... It's just the way you act with Galen. I'm... I began. I couldn't figure out a way to say what I wanted to say. How do you tell your mother that you've fallen for the same guy that she has? The situation seemed to get worse every day. The more things he did for her, the angrier I got. He should be doing those things for me. With the way things were going, I was no longer sure that my plan would work. If it didn't, someone was going to get hurt. And I'd end up the bad guy, Beth. Halloween is a strange time of year, but it paled in comparison to me. Only two months ago, I had been a very happy and fulfilled girl whose only thoughts were planning out my upcoming wedding and making Galen happy. Now not only was I not engaged I had under the influence of my formula, killed two men. Two months ago I had to call Galen if I found a spider in our bedroom. Now the only thoughts I had concerning the two co-workers I had murdered was fuck them, they had it coming. I was so locked inside of my head as I walked towards the lab that I bumped into someone and fell backwards. A hand reached out to help me to my feet. As I grabbed for the hand, my eyes locked on Galen's. Sorry, Beth. I guess I wasn't paying any attention to where I was going, he said. I wasn't either, Galan, I said. He smiled at me for a second and then anger flashed across his face. What was that for? I asked. What? he asked. You looked at me and then got pissed, I said. We were having a nice cordial conversation and then... Poof. Anger. He looked down. I'm sorry, Beth. I had no right, he said. No right to what? I asked. I was confused. Was even Galen about to make a fat joke? I... I... Looked at you and I noticed your breasts and all of that cleavage that's showing and... He began. And what? I asked. I've been told that the one good thing about fat girls is that they have big tits. He just looked at the floor. Go ahead, Galen, I said. I've heard all of the jokes. What joke? He asked. I was pissed that you were walking around showing them to everyone. I guess I was just remembering when they... When you were... All mine. Or at least I was stupid enough to think you were. Yeah. I said nastily. But you only became stupid when you started believing that I and they weren't yours. Galen, I'm still all yours. But I'm your all-human girl. I have all kinds of fears and insecurities, and I did a really dumb thing that got out of control because of them. In short, I made a really big, really dumb mistake. But I never stopped loving you. I also never gave up on you, or walked away from you. You did that. But if it makes you feel any better, as soon as I get into the lab, I'll button my lab coat all the way up to my neck. That way none of the guys will see your titties. Will that make you happy? Surprisingly, he nodded, and I felt better than I had in months. Galen, can you do something to make me happy? I asked. He just turned and nodded. Could you come to the apartment tomorrow so I can tell you my part of how I ruined our lives? Even if it's only for closure, I think you owe me at least the chance to explain. 
I said. He nodded. I hope to see you at the party tonight, I said as he walked away. I felt for the first time in months that there was hope. Glory. Everyone was acting weird. All of my co-workers were traveling to and from the building in groups. Over the last week, two of us had been killed by whatever type of animal was stalking the area. The police couldn't seem to find any type of pattern. The only connection between Craig and Todd was that they both worked for our company. But even the places where they were killed differed. Craig had been in our parking lot. Todd had been at a gas station down the street. I think Todd's was the one that scared the shit out of everyone. He'd been murdered in front of witnesses by some sort of bear-ape hybrid. At least we knew what it was now, but everyone was staying in groups, so if the thing was spotted, there would be lots of people to help. Besides, most animals only attacked prey that was alone and weaker. They tended not to go after groups of animals. Then there was my daughter. Grace had always been a little hard to figure out, but now she was a mystery. I couldn't for the life of me figure out her motivations. But above all, I myself was a mystery. I was going away from my own ideals. I had become something I never thought I could be. But I was happy. Was I really? I guess I had always told myself that no matter what happened, I would never give up. And now I had. Was I settling for Galan because I no longer believed that Mark would ever want me again? Or was I just facing reality and allowing myself to be happy? Only time would tell. As I got dressed for the party, I had to admit that Grace had chosen a great costume for me. Not many women my age could pull it off. But then I wasn't built like a 55-year-old woman. A few days ago, Grace and I had stood next to each other in the mirror, and except for some sagging and a few wrinkles in strategic places, our bodies were identical. She'd chosen an I Dream of Genie costume for me. I couldn't wait for Galen to see it. The diaphanous pants and crop top showcased my long legs, my tiny waist, and my boobs. I might not make it through the party. Once Galen got a look at me, he'd be ready to leave the party so he could bring me home. And I intended to let him. And for once, I didn't care who knew it. The funny part was that I had a mask with a veil so no one would know who I was. But I would know Galen because Grace had told me about his costume. Galen was going as Optimus Prime. He had an incredible robot costume with a full mask. I was sure that Optimus would be dreaming of Genie because I was going to tease him relentlessly. I had time to come home and get into my costume. Galan was going to change at the party because he was going to be seeing customers all the way until the party started. I drove back to work and arrived just as my phone rang. I picked it up and answered it. Where are you? Asked Galan. I just got back to work. Where are you? I asked him back. Who's with you? He asked. Why do you want to know? I asked back. The thought of Galen being jealous made me feel really good. Glory, you know I worry about you, he said. You promised me that you would always have someone with you when you were in that parking lot. Sorry, honey, I said. It won't happen again. And on my way out, I'll have you with me, okay? I love you, Glory. I don't want anything to happen to you, he said. Galen. I hesitated. I love you too. His intake of air told me that he was as shocked by what I had said as I was for saying it. The happiness in his voice after that made me feel warm all over. I felt good to finally start getting my life back on track. I had spent too many years pining over a man who was never going to love me the way that I deserved. Maybe giving me Galen was fate's way of rewarding me for what I had gone through. But somehow, it just didn't seem right. I guess that maybe I just needed time for things to break themselves in. It was kind of like when you first started wearing a new pair of shoes. They were stiff and uncomfortable at first. But after a little bit of time, they became more and more comfortable, until they were your favorite pair of comfortable old slippers. Given a few months, Galen would become my comfortable old slippers. So perhaps it was the fact that I wanted to make Galen happy that made me wait until I saw a few of my co-workers pull into the parking lot to get out of my car. I quickly went over and entered the building along with the crowd of them. That way I could assure Galan that I hadn't walked through the parking lot alone. It was funny, but knowing that he cared that much about me gave me a warm feeling. 
It was also funny that all of the men I came eye contact with stared appreciatively at me. The hours of yoga and Pilates were worth every second. But the funniest thing was that they seemed to have no idea who I was. I could pretty much figure out who most of the women were. The especially short or fat ones were very easy. The men were even easier. Most of them couldn't keep their mouths closed, and their loud-assed bellowing gave them away. I kept looking at the clock waiting for Galen to show up, and as soon as he did, he started looking around for me. His costume was incredible. It was all hard plastic, and from a distance, you almost couldn't tell that he wasn't a real robot. Almost everyone he ran into wanted to talk to him, but I could see that his mind was dead set on finding me. I felt so sorry for him. It was almost funny. He ignored all of the men and said only one word to each woman who tried to stop him. Glory, he'd say. They'd usually say something stupid like, do I look like I'm in my fifties? And he would just excuse himself and walk away. Clearly the boy had a one-track mind and I was the only train on his track. I watched him moving through room after room looking for me and then I lost track of him. After a few moments, I had the weirdest feeling in the pit of my stomach. I turned around and there he was behind me. Up close he seemed a bit shorter than he'd seen from across the room, but there was no mistaking that robot costume. I batted my eyes from behind my veil and he walked up to me without saying a word. I was sure that he either recognized the body that he knew so intimately or Grace had told him about my costume. I guess it was only fair since she'd told me about his. He never said a word, so I figured two could play that game. I remained silent too. Behind us, the music had started. Still remaining silent, he led me out to the dance floor. I don't know if Galen understood it, but the whole masks and silent treatment thing had me hornier than ever before. The big brooding type was a definite turn on. As we danced, he pulled me against him. It had me wishing that his costume wasn't made completely of hard plastic sections. I really wanted to feel something hard rubbing against me, but I wanted something made of hard, warm flesh. Galan, we're not staying for very long, I said. Who's Galen, he asked, sending me into shock. Galen. I was walking through room after room looking for glory. The thing that had me confused was how ridiculous most of the people at the party were acting. Things were just getting started, and some of them were already well on the way to being drunk. Most of the men there were too old to understand who Optimus Prime was. They kept stopping in front of me and doing that inane robot dance from the 80s. They also wanted to know where I got my costume. I really didn't have time for chit-chat, I had to find Glory. I asked several of the women I came in contact with if they had seen her. Very few of them actually answered me. Some of them were stupid, others were insulted. Most of them wanted to know if I knew who they were. Grace had told me that her mother would be wearing an I Dream of Jeannie costume, so I knew what to look for. I just hadn't run into her yet. But the building was huge, and the party was stretched out over two floors. Even then, with over 800 employees there, I could conceivably spend most of the night trying to find glory. We should have come up with a place to meet. I decided to go up to the second floor and work my way down. As I got on the elevator, a woman got on with me. There was no doubt that it was Beth. Hi, Galan, she said cheerfully. Great costume. How'd you know it was me, I asked. Galan, I've been in love with you forever, she said. You could be inside of a brick wall and I'd know you. I know your posture and all of your mannerisms. You couldn't hide from me if you tried. Hearing Beth say that really made me feel good. For a moment, Glory was forgotten. So what does my costume make you think of, honey? She asked saucily. Her nurse's costume left very little to the imagination. The white top was cut so low and the belt was so tight under her breasts that it was like her boobs were on a shelf waiting to be picked up and inspected closely. It makes me think. I stopped abruptly, not wanting to be rude. Go on, Galen, she said. Be honest. Let it out. It makes me think that you totally ignored what we talked about this morning, I said. And that maybe there's no need for us to talk tomorrow. It's like the old days when I used to dress you up and I finally just had you running around the apartment naked. But then you were only doing it for me. She laughed. 
And you're really pissed about me wearing this here, aren't you? She asked. You don't like me showing these big old titties to everyone else, huh? The elevator had reached the second floor, and as the doors began to open, Beth pushed the door close button, and they stopped and closed up again. She pushed the button for the 15th floor, and the elevator started up again. Where were we, she asked. Oh yeah, you were angry about me showing my tits. Galen, you have to decide what you want. I wore this costume tonight for two reasons. Number one, I wanted to remind you of what you have, if you still want it. And number two, I wanted you to know that no one else here matters. Most of these men aren't even vaguely interested in me, and the ones who are can't have me. Whether you realize it or not, I'm still yours, Galan. I made a really stupid mistake and I'll never do it again. I wore this costume only for you, baby. We were so close together that she was rubbing herself against my costume. Shit, Galan. I can't even feel you in that suit, she said. Then she stepped away from me and pulled the back of her costume up. All I could see were thick legs and a thong-covered pussy. She turned around and bent down showing me her huge tight ass, and I almost lost it. Maybe we'll end up doing more than just talking tomorrow, Galan, she purred. Then she suddenly straightened up, and the elevator doors opened. She walked away without another word. I stood there in shock for a while. I was really confused. There were all kinds of thoughts going through my mind. Did I love Glory? Or was I still hung up on Beth? I pushed the button for the top floor and rode the elevator all the way up there again. This time I got out. There was nothing on the top floor, it was mostly storage. I stood there trying to calm down and get some semblance of order to my thoughts. I still had feelings for Beth, I knew it. We had been together for a long time. At the same time I cared for Glory too. I enjoyed sex with both of them, but for different reasons. Beth had everything. She had that big soft ass and miles of titties. Beth was, or I had once believed, totally mine. I could blow her a kiss from across the room and make her nipples so hard they stood up. On the surface, I seemed like a mild-mannered Clark Kent type, but when I got Beth alone, we got freaky. Beth would do whatever I wanted her to, no questions asked. With Glory, I had to work harder, to get her to try things, and I guess somehow, working for it made things with her all the sweeter. Anal sex was a good example of that. Beth took no effort. She just let me do it. I didn't even need to ask. I tried to be very gentle the first time because I wanted her to enjoy it too. But she just went along with it even though I'm sure that first time was painful. After a while, it ceased to even matter where I fucked her, as long as I did. The first time I tried it with Glory she shut me down so fast I got whiplash. It took weeks before she even let me stick my finger in her ass. But once I got her used to it, I think she really liked it. We still didn't do it very often though. She gave me her ass only when she was on her period and really horny, or if she wanted to give me a special treat. Between the two of them it was surprising when you considered the differences in their bodies, but Beth was tighter and felt better. I guess it was because Glory was older. She'd also given birth to a child and she was more experienced. Glory had the advantage though of never having hurt me. Perhaps I realized for the first time that was the entire thing in a nutshell. Maybe Glory was only a security blanket. Maybe I just loved fucking her and I felt safe with her. Maybe I still loved Beth but I simply couldn't trust her. Or maybe it was just that because of our ages, I had so much more in common with Beth. Glory had already lived most of a lifetime. She had already been through all of the things like a marriage and having children that I had yet to experience. If I wanted those things and I did, they couldn't come from Glory. At the same time, Beth and I had been engaged. We were still in the walking around on sunshine stage of our relationship and she had already cheated on me. How the fuck was I supposed to trust her for the long haul? I had once read a book about meditation it taught that when you had a tough situation to deal with, sometimes the best thing to do was to simply clear your mind and close your eyes. Very often the solution to your problems would come to you. I got back on the elevator and decided that as soon as the party was over, I would meditate on it. When I got out of the elevator, among all of the people dancing and drinking and acting a fool, there was a woman in the I Dream of Genie costume. I'd been looking for crooking her finger at me. I walked over to her and wrapped her in my arms, 
She sighed contentedly and molded herself against me with everyone watching us. She pulled me onto the dance floor and I guess you could call what we did dancing. But truthfully, it was just one long hug while walking slowly in a circle to music. Even though I was still wearing the thick gloves of my costume, I could feel those curves on that slim body. My hands knew the contours of that body well, but they felt different. Maybe it was the gloves, but somehow Glory felt tighter and more firm. And when she sighed, I knew that we would not be staying at the party for very long. Glory was practically humping my leg. I can't say that I blamed her. I was tingling all over, and although I loved Glory, she had never given me tingles before. I wish I wasn't wearing this mask, I said. I feel like kissing you right now so badly, but in a way, I'm glad we're surrounded by all of these people, because if I start, I'm not going to stop with a kiss. She gave me a very sexy, very throaty laugh, and I noticed that her voice wasn't quite as deep as it usually was. I chalked it up to the veil, distorting it, or maybe she was as excited as I am. This is the way I want to feel for the rest of my life, I said. I know I could make you happy if you give me the chance. She pressed her boobs and her lower body against me and looked into my eyes. Galen, I feel the same way, she said, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I've wanted you for a while, but you seem to be so stuck on my mother. But if everything works out tonight, all of us can be happy. Grace, I said in shock. She lowered her veil and just smiled at me. Before I could protest, she grabbed my hand and took me over to the balcony near the huge curving stairwell that looked out over the lobby and the first floor below us. She pointed to a couple dancing on the first floor. The fact that they were holding each other as closely as Grace and I had been only a few moments before wasn't surprising. What was surprising was that the woman had on an I Dream of Jeannie costume that was identical to the one Grace was wearing and the man she was pressing herself against was wearing an Optimus Prime costume that was exactly like mine. I glared at Grace and then back at Glory. Grace was grinning from ear to ear. See, she said, everyone can be happy. How the hell am I supposed to be happy about the woman I love cheating on me? I snarled. Galen, she isn't cheating on you, dummy, said Grace. She's been cheating with you. The two of you never belong together. It's just wrong, and besides that, it's just creepy. I understand it, but shit. No one else would. You and my mother are both broken toys. You were so hurt by what your ex did to you that you just reached out and found comfort anywhere you could. And my mother was in the same boat. But honey, all you guys had in common is a broken heart and a need for sex. But I, I began. She silenced me with a finger to my lips. No, you don't, Galen, she said. You're a really special guy, but you don't love my mother. You think you do because she took away the pain from what your ex did to you and my mom. God, I hope I'm as youthful and dynamic as she is when I'm her age. But Galan, you're not right for her. She just felt sorry for you. At the same time, she was very lonely and the two of you just found comfort in each other. My mom needs to be with someone her age. It's almost time for her to retire and spoil her grandkids. You, on the other hand, need to have a life. You need to get married and have some babies. My mom is too old for that and she's already done it. You know I'm right, Galan. And deep down in my heart, I knew that she was. But I hated her for it. So who's the asshole you got to replace me with? I managed to choke out. He's not your replacement, honey, she said. You were his. Do you think my mom is some kind of whore? She's only been with two guys her entire life. Why the hell do you think she's all over him like that? Her body knows him even if her mind hasn't figured it out yet. That's my dad. Oh, I said sadly. So, I guess maybe they do belong together. You got what you wanted, Grace. I guess you guys all got what you wanted, I said. Gallon, she said as I started to walk away. Where are you going? Get your ass back over here. We're not done. What else is there? I asked. This is hard enough. Do you really need to rub my face in it? I no, honey, you've got this all wrong. I want you to be happy too, she said. Grace, just how is that possible? I asked. Am I supposed to share your mom with your dad? Sorry, but I'm just not the sharing type. Galen, I know you still think my mom is perfect for you, but I think you need your own version of her. 
A version of her who's about your age and not hooked on someone else, you know? She said. Maybe someone who looks like her, thinks like her, acts like her, is built like her, but is young enough to build a life with you. I didn't say anything. Maybe someone who you were just rubbing against like a dog in heat, Galen, she said. The same person that you were just saying you wanted to spend the rest of your life making happy? Okay. I guess I have to do all of the work here. She reached up and pulled my helmet-like mask off. Then she took off her veil and just kissed me. I tried not react, but the second those soft lips touched mine, my fate was sealed. I pulled her to me and she sighed again, the same way she'd done a few moments before when I thought she was Glory. This might work, I said. Yeah, but there are going to have to be some changes made, she said. Like what, I asked. From now on, I'm the one you're going to make run around the house naked, she said. And it had better be me that's in your bed screaming all the time. I don't think that's going to be a problem, I said. I pointed across the floor, where Glory had discovered that it was her ex-husband she was dancing with. She looked up at us and waved. I hugged Grace and waved back at her. She gave me the thumbs up sign, letting me know that everything was fine. Before I could answer her, everything went to hell. Every head in the building turned as we heard the sound of a man screaming in pain. The scream was so high pitched that it sounded like a woman. The scream was abruptly cut off in a bellowing roar, so loud that it curdled the blood of most of the people in the building, erupted from one of the locked offices. The next thing I knew, a body crashed through the wall. Luckily, the walls were only drywall, not brick. But throwing a man through one of them was still quite a feat. The body was bloody and out of sorts, but from the way it was writhing in pain, still alive. And then like a nightmare, footsteps, if the beast-like stomping could be called footsteps, echoed ever louder and angrier from the darkened office. The people on the first floor were all frozen in terror and stupefied curiosity as the steps got louder and closer to the beast emerging from the office. And then two surprisingly hand-like paws tore their way through the hole in the drywall. The hands were enlarging the hole so the huge head could force its way through. The foul-smelling apish body covered with coarse fur and the remains of tattered clothing, emerged next. The monster was over six and a half feet tall and enraged as it tore its way through the hole in the wall. I found myself wondering why it didn't just use the door right beside the hole. As the monster entered the larger hall of the lobby, it roared again, and most of the frozen people finally reacted and started to flee in terror. The monstrous head swiveled around on its thick, muscular, post-like neck and locked its gaze on me. As we made eye contact and its gaze swung past me, I realized that the monster was actually looking at Grace, Beth. From the second I got off of the elevator, my smile had everyone staring at me. Even though I wore a mask over my eyes and nose, they all knew who I was anyway. You couldn't hide a body as big as mine. Everything was working the way I wanted it to. I had Galen eating out of my hand. I was sure that when he came over the next day, that we would end up back together. The biggest question on my mind was whether or not I should meet him at the door naked, the way he always liked me. What the fuck are you smiling about, fat ass? The gruff voice behind me could only belong to one person. I turned to see what he wanted, and was shocked. It was of course Brent, and he was half drunk. Oh yeah, he said. You're okay. I'm the one who needs to be afraid. You're safe. Safe from what, I asked. Your boyfriend, Galan, of course, he said. Brent, what the fuck are you whining about, I asked. Oh God, he whined. Besides being fat, you're stupid too. Think about it. Craig is dead. Todd is dead. What do we all have in common? He looked at me. Your boyfriend caught the three of us fucking you, he said. So I know that Galen is going to kill me too. I burst out laughing. Galen had nothing to do with them dying, I said. They have witnesses. Some sort of animal killed Todd in full public view. Okay, even if he isn't the killer, he's going to fire me as soon as they make him the sales manager, whined Brent. Even as he whined, he was staring at my tits. Something in my brain just clicked. All of my problems were over. One of the biggest obstacles to Galen and I getting back together was him being reminded of what had happened every time he saw one of those guys. 
With Craig and Todd out of the picture, only Brent was left as a reminder. Brent, you know that Galan and I are no longer together, I crooned. So if you wanted some, you know, just for old time's sake, he looked around to make sure no one was paying us any attention. Then we ducked out of the room and down the hall. There was a row of offices that was along the back wall of the huge lobby. We slipped inside one of them with no one the wiser. As Brent watched every way but at me, I gulped my formula. I hadn't intended on taking it, but I had brought it with me just in case. It was strange, but I didn't need the formula for Galen. He loved me just the way I was. I had no need to try to improve myself. But for everyone else, I seemed to need to try to win their approval by making myself something I wasn't. Even as Brent dragged me into that office, I started to protest. There were too many people around. I needed to get him to take me out to the parking lot, but he was having none of it. Holy shit, are my eyes playing tricks on me? He asked. You aren't fat anymore. No, baby, I'm not and I'm all yours, I whispered. Now take me out to your car and fuck me. Mm-mm, he said. We're doing it right here. He grabbed both of my arms and forced them behind my back. Then he bent me over and ripped those tiny panties that I had just shown to Galan right off of me. He slapped my ass so hard that it scared me. Then he forced his knee between my legs to separate them. No, Brent. We have to go out to the parking lot, I said. Shut up, bitch, he said. If you keep talking, I'll have to stick something in your mouth to keep it closed. He spat into his hand and smeared it over my dry pussy. Brent, you're pissing me off, I said. I told you I want to do it in the parking lot. You're not listening to me, and that makes me really angry. Brent, you wouldn't like me if I'm angry. He clamped his hand over my mouth and slammed his dick home. The pain was so bad, it felt as if someone had stabbed a hot knife into my pussy. I don't know, he said. You seem to be much tighter when you're angry. This feels much better than that flabby fat girl pussy you used to give me. He humped away at me with me constantly trying to push him off. My body was again flooded with adrenaline, and after only a few painful strokes, Brent sprayed his thin runny sperm in my pussy. Oh shit, he grunted. If you're knocked up, it ain't my kid. Give me a minute and we can go again. He leaned back on the desk and then noticed what was happening to me. My entire body vibrated and the hair started to sprout. My arms and legs grew bigger and my boobs flattened against my chest. Holy fuck, he spat. It's... it's a... a monster. I leaped across the distance separating us and slashed at him with my clawed hand. He tried to duck and only succeeded in escaping most of the force behind the blow. My claws opened up a huge gash across his cheek and laid it open to the bone. He screamed like a girl and tried to run, but I grabbed him by one of his legs. Something in me was still functioning, so I realized that I needed to silence him. I flung him at the wall as hard as I could, expecting to shatter his puny body against the bricks. Unfortunately, the wall was only a thin drywall sheet with a painted brick veneer. Brent crashed through the drywall and landed in a heap, with his body twitching as if he was having some sort of seizure or spasms. I roared in protest. He was still alive. All of this was for nothing if Brent lived. Somehow, even the beast recognized that. I also realized that if he lived and told the story about how he was attacked, I was done. I charged the wall and ripped a hole in it that was just big enough to get my body through. I would rip Brent's throat out and escape the building. I knew that I had less than five minutes left before I would begin to change back, so I needed to be quick. There was utter chaos as I emerged from the hole in the wall. Everyone I saw was screaming and trying to get away. The same people who belittled me and made fun of poor fat Beth were screaming and running away from me in abject terror. It was funny to me. I stood up and roared again, making the poor pitiful ass little people run even faster. They were trampling each other in their rush to get away from me. And then I saw them. They were there on the steps. My gallon, he was standing there and he wasn't afraid. But there was some whore I had never seen before clutching his arm like he belonged to her. In a fraction of a second, Brent was forgotten. I could track him anywhere in the city. But that bitch holding on to Galen had to die. I could probably do her and then come back to Brent. He was so badly hurt that he wasn't going anywhere. 
From the blood that I could smell, he would probably die soon if he didn't get medical attention anyway. My rage at Brent faded, and I went berserk with the need to kill the bitch who had tried to claim my matey. I leaped over several clumsy people who were trying to get away from me, two leaps and then a third, and I was not only across the large room but halfway up the huge stairway. I could almost taste that whore's blood and her fear. Her eyes were as big as basketballs and she knew I was coming for her. She was frozen in place and I started to leap at her and rip her soft, weak throat out. There was no way she could either escape from me or fight me off. But then just as I started my leap, something else drew my attention. Hey! screamed Galen, or go fetch! He kicked one of the support spindles out of the stairway's banister and threw the heavy piece of wood at me. It hit me in the head and knocked me to the side. Come and get me, he yelled. Half of me was pissed at him, but the other half recognized my mate. Both halves of me found Galen much more interesting and forgot about the whore on the floor at his feet. I had her scent as well, though. So as Galen took off running away from her, my instinct to chase prey forced me to follow him. Strangely enough, I was having trouble catching him. Galen was running flat out in a weird zigzag pattern. Every time I started to gain on him, he changed direction. And since Galen ran every day, he was in good enough physical condition to make it challenging. As Galen led me off one way, the crowd went the other way. And before I recognized it, Galen had me outside of the building. I realized then what he had hoped for, but also his mistake. Galen, my love, ever the Boy Scout was trying to get me away from all of the people inside. He also hoped that he could get to his car. He figured if he could get to it, there was no way I could keep up with his precious Mustang. And he was right about that. Where he made his mistake, though, was in underestimating me and overestimating his own physical skills. I had slipped on the smooth flooring inside of the building. My claws couldn't dig into the hard ceramic flooring. But in the dirt and rough concrete of the parking lot, I began to gain ground. Galen had also forgotten that by running out through the front door, he couldn't get to the parking lot without going over a locked fence. The gate in the front of the building had been locked after the incidents with Craig and Todd. Galen could run, but he couldn't leap over a six-foot-tall wire mesh fence. It didn't matter. Even in that form, I would never hurt Galen. But I did want to play with him a bit. He deserved it for hitting me in the head with that stick, and also for being with that dirty bitch at the party. He was mine and I was his. There had been too many other people involved in our relationship as it was. With every step we took, I grew closer to Galen until I was nipping at his heels. Then he pissed me off. That goddamn Galen head faked me. He looked left, but then quickly veered off to the right. I crashed heavily into the building that was on our left side. I ran after Galen and I was pissed. I slashed at him and my claws ripped through his pants and gashed his leg. I stopped and howled in regret for causing him pain. I had to get my temper in check. I looked at Galen's blood on my paws and realized that I had hurt him badly. He wasn't able to run anymore. He was just hobbling and dripping blood with every step, but he never gave up. He had reached the fence when I started back after him. He was climbing slowly and painfully for the top of the fence. When I reached it, I effortlessly leaped over the fence landing on the other side. The movement surprised him. He caught his shoe in the fence and fell, but he was really caught on the fence. There he was hanging by his shoe on the fence less than a foot away from me. He stared into my bestial maw and I realized suddenly that he wasn't afraid of me. I realized that in the same way that I'd been able to recognize him in that fucking costume, even before he took off the mask, Galan somehow knew that I would never hurt him. I felt it then, the weakness that signaled the onset of me reverting back to poor, fat Beth. I had probably less than a minute before I would begin shedding the hair and shrinking. I reached out to Galen in a gesture that I think he knew was affectionate. I think he also knew that the gash to his leg had been accidental. I knew that Galen understood it all and things were going to be fine between us. I reached out to try to free my lover from the fence and never made it. The first of the high-velocity shells struck me in the chest so hard that it lifted me off of my feet. The bullet hit me before the sound of the shot reached us. I tried to get away then. No! screamed Galen, waving his hands. Don't shoot! Out of nowhere, the police SWAT team approached. Two more bullets hit me in quick succession. Galen fell off of the fence, then he hobbled over to me. I was changing back to Fat Beth, even as I began to die. Galen! 
I lay there in the parking lot with Beth's head cradled in my lap. It suddenly started to rain. I had a flashback to that time a few months ago, when after a very rigorous session of morning sex, I was laying on the floor of our shower with Beth's head cradled in my lap, in much the same way. I had known then that I should never have let her go that morning. It had been the morning when everything went wrong. Now as we both lay there bleeding, the rain washed our mixed blood away from us and down the sewers. I love you, Beth, I said softly as my consciousness started to fade from loss of blood. The gas she had given me was deeper than either of us knew. Love you too, honey, she said. Galen, don't let them get the formula. All of my notes are hidden. In... apartment. You know where. Galen, burn them. And then she was gone. The men from the SWAT team were confused. They thought that they had shot and killed a monster. But when they got to me, they found me cuddling with a very pale, very human woman. There were three bullet holes in her. They were in roughly the same places they had shot the monster. A crowd started to gather around the scene, and they quickly cordoned off the area and called an ambulance in. Sir, stay with us, sir, they kept saying as things got darker and darker. Epilogue. Galan. The first thing I remember from when I woke up in the hospital was something lying across me and squeezing my hand. I struggled to get my eyes to open, and then I coughed several times. Like lightning, whatever was lying across me, moved. The light in the room came on, and I blinked several times to get my eyes to adjust. Galen, honey, you're awake, she gushed. You scared the shit out of me. It was Grace. How? I croaked. My throat was as dry as the Sahara. She handed me a glass of water. How long was I out? I asked. Three days, she gushed. That thing, that fucking monster clawed your leg to the bone. It took them three surgeries to reconnect your muscles to your femur. They can't figure out how the hell you were able to run like that. She just beamed at me. Galen, you saved my life, she gushed. That thing was coming after me, but you jumped in front of it. You saved Brent, too. It was touch and go, but they think he's going to pull through. The only sad thing was that they couldn't save Beth. Apparently, she ran after you to try to save you or something. Anyway, the creature killed her the same way it killed Todd and Craig and tried to get Brent. I don't know any of those guys, but my mom said you two worked with them. I'm so glad you're okay, honey. We're... She was interrupted by the arrival of several men in suits and a couple in lab coats. Ms. Jones, can we speak to him for a few moments? asked one of the men. Grace turned and looked at me. I'll be right outside, honey, she said. I have to go tell my mom that you're okay anyway. It's good to see you awake, Mr. Stevens, said one of the men. We thought for a while that the ape might have killed you too. We all know that it wasn't an ape, I said. Your SWAT team shot my ex-girlfriend. I have no idea how she turned into that thing, I began. I spent a couple of hours telling them everything I knew, including how the three men Beth had killed were connected to us. They in turn gave me the cover story that I would tell anyone to explain what happened. In exchange for my silence and going along with the party line, the U.S. government had given me $3 million after I signed a non-disclosure package. Beth was buried a few days later. Everyone in town looked at her as a hero. In death, she had the affection and respect that had been denied her during her life. Brent lived, but he was never the same. They were able to sew up the wounds in his face. But even after several plastic surgeries, you can still tell that he had half of his face clawed off. Being thrown through the wall had also damaged his spine so severely that he will probably never walk again. But the greatest damage was to his mind. Brent spends most of his time screaming at flashbacks of monsters attacking him. Even during the rare instances that he is lucid, his memory is spotty. And most of all, he is deathly afraid of fat women. I was released from the hospital after another month. It took more than a year of physical therapy before I could run again. But I'm back to it. Maybe I'm not as fast as I was, or as strong. But I get better every day. Glory remarried her ex-husband. He's a really nice guy, he's very driven, but at the same time very shy. They've both retired now and he puts all of his time and focus on glory. They're traveling now, 
They take lots of trips all over the world to see all of the things they want to see before they begin the next phase of their lives. They're looking forward to being grandparents. Grace and I got to know each other much better while she helped me through my recovery. Although it seems quick, we really were suited to each other, and we love each other very much. Grace, Glory, and I all agreed that it would be best if her husband only knows me as Grace's husband. It would color our relationship and theirs with a bad brush if he ever found out that I had spent three months fucking Glory, and that if Grace hadn't tricked us at the Halloween party, they might not have gotten back together. I did become the sales manager and later on vice president of the entire company. Grace and I love each other, and as far as she knows, have no secrets from each other. Unfortunately, we have two. Besides the really big one about Beth that I have never related to anyone, there's one more thing that no one including Grace knows. I did go back to our old apartment after both the police and the government concluded their investigations. There, inside of a heating pipe that was no longer hooked to the furnace, I found all of Beth's notes and her formula. I have no use for it, but I have never destroyed it. I saw firsthand what it turned my sweet, gentle, loving Beth into. The government has no business getting their greedy hands on something that dangerous. Even so, I couldn't bring myself to destroy it because Beth put her heart and soul into it, and maybe someday, someone can use it to do some good. Grace and I have settled in for the long haul. We want a family with kids, a dog, and the whole nine yards. We're going to name our second daughter after Glory someday. Grace is already pregnant with our first. We decided by unanimous decision to name her Beth.